report to the cloud. Okay, mm -hmm. it says it's recording. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Also, Doris, there is one quote uh, which has some German words in it, uh, maybe five or 10 slides in. So I might need some help with that. You got it. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, Tim, if you could, uh, <laughs> no, we'll make sure everyone is muted. Don't worry, I think there's only one of us that um, uh, mute. Dario, uh, I wonder if I can ask the question. Uh, I'm using the chat box for asking questions. How do you prefer to handle questions? Uh, so there'll be um, three or four spots where we're going to stop for questions. And... Um, and otherwise, I would say, uh, yeah, I just have to make sure I keep my eye visually on the flow and the box that's there. If you could type that in. I know some of you are in very quiet spots, but others of you, you might be surprised at how much the noise comes in. Not to me, because for some reason, when I'm the... I don't know why that is, but... Um, but yeah, I would just say type in the box, but do know I will open it up three or four times for questions. Okay, so um, the rest of the Dario? To produce the handouts, yes. Sorry, yes. me again. There was a way where you were talking and you were doing something with a microphone and your audio cut out, just to be aware. With the, I think it was a hand movement or? It's probably this. Oh, okay. Yes, okay, beautiful. Okay, well, that's good to know too. I'll keep that away. Um, yes, you're allowed to reproduce the handouts for your clients. Um, is there a link to the handouts? I don't have them yet. They, they're inside an email attachment that I sent you. It would have arrived at around 9 a.m. this morning for you from me, and they're in the email itself. So you just click on them or, or download all, and you should be able to get those. Um, don't we, We're not going to use them instantly. So no, you have a few minutes as you're listening to, to search through your email if you received a lot since this morning. Um, and then great Ian for your question. Okay, perfect. So we will mute everyone. Um, oh, got it. Okay, that's how it's working. Do, do, do. Okay, and once more, sorry about that, Valerie. Okay, there we go. And I think everyone is, no, not quite. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure this morning to uh, be with all of you, even though we're um, across a small pond. And um, yeah, to talk about type. And we've done a little bit of an introduction on what we're going to be exploring today. So uh, let's get into that. And uh, I'm going to share, um, I'm going to take away my lovely visage for a moment and uh, or five and go towards share screen. Okay. Um, hmm. Sorry, just one moment. Uh, oh, right. I remember I have to press on the whole thing. No, we don't want to go to that workshop. There we go. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can see the slides now. And this is, uh, yes, the opportunity to use, that's interesting. So when I go to the slide mode, it hides your comments. So I'm gonna have to somehow bring those up again. Otherwise I'll never see anyone's, okay, there we go. Okay, beautiful. Now I believe we're all ready to go. So yeah, so there's a little bit, uh, I'll rewind two steps, priming the alchemy of opposites, um, where Britain and Los Angeles come together. And uh, what we'll be exploring today, we talked about that, uh, alchemy and opposites, uh, the transcendent function, and then some practical applications for the third, sixth and, uh, you know, fourth functions, um, not in that order. And I think a lot of what we'll say with the, the sixth function also applies to the fifth as well. So there's an application there too. And then some wrap up with that. Uh, confirming you have your workshop materials. Those are in the email that uh, you received around 9 a.m. your time. And um, 
Yeah, there'll be, there's a number of them that are articles and so on, and we'll be using uh, two of them specifically. The one that is on, um, this is wisdom, sixth function, and the other one is uh, synergy of opposites. Okay, so Jung described one-sidedness in the psyche and in life. And you know, it's, it's very easy, especially with the term like mental functions or cognitive processes, to think that maybe type is only about being in the head or just in the person's nervous system. But this is not the case. Uh, the type development includes the environment that the person is in and that our use of the functions come about because we engage the environment and reflect upon it and that they manifest with the environment and that we can actually get into trouble with the function, especially a non-preferred one, if we neglect what it usually helps us with, with the environment. So an example would be extroverted feeling and its gift of uh, interpersonally working with others. So interpersonal, yes, there are other people. So we need that environment and that other people is not just something to work off of, but the other people are much of what are carrying the, the, the impulses and the contents of extroverted feeling. Other people's values, society's values, their needs, uh, their emotions, um, their opinions, all of that. And he described an alchemical solution to this one-sidedness. And he thought, by the way, one-sidedness is necessary, but it could get to extremes too. So this part here, we don't need to go into great depth. It's just a reminder that Jung described four mental functions, uh, not eight, uh, you know, he says sensing, intuiting. And um, th these are not any kind of official uh, definitions. They're just ones that I happen to use when I need a little snapshot for each. Uh, you know, sensing and intuiting, two different ways of perceiving the world, uh, gathering information and, and responding to it in an open-ended way. And relying upon the senses versus relying on imagination. And, and actually, we all have imagination and we all use our senses, just like we all use both hands, left and right. But we have a go-to hand home base, and uh, Isabel Myers with her uh, signature writing activity really covered that nicely. And we have thinking and feeling as two different ways of making decisions and organizing, relying upon, let's say, logic and, and values. I don't believe we can have precise definitions of these, uh, and that's actually fantastic because Jung viewed uh, type, as, as Peter Geyer has, uh, has pointed out a number of times, he viewed type as a mandala. It's something that we continually can go back to and look at a function in a new way and, and understand it in a new way. So Jung did notice that there were these uh, mental functions and these are ways that we mediate between ourselves, um, our physical environment, our social environment, our uh, even inborn gifts. We talked about like music or athleticism. There are ways that we mediate um, uh, and, and essentially become human as we're growing up. You also talked about one-sidedness, and here are some quotes, uh, mostly from psychological types, uh, that he tried to establish the general lines along which one-sidedness devel developments move. When a function habitually predominates, a typical attitude is produced. And uh, attitude, of course, Jung meant that in a specific way in his book, but he also meant it in a general way. You know, there, and we'll talk about this towards the end, there are attitudes that come along with uh, our preferred function. And, and attitudes meaning like opinions and preferences and, and beliefs in, in the, the everyday sense of the word as well as the type sense. According to the nature of the, the differentiated function, in other words, the preferred function, dominant, whatever it is, there will be a typical thinking, feeling, sensation, or intuitive attitude. So he talks about those four. It says, when any of these attitudes is habitual, I speak of a type. So he's actually saying that type is a habit, and, uh, which is sort of neat. So it's, it's as you grow up, and that might just be the first two years of life, is you really inculcate this uh, and practice this dominant function, it becomes a habit. But that means also other functions can become habits too. Um, and in fact, we can sort of level up, as the millennial phrase goes, and, and uh, find new ways to express our dominant through new habits. Each of the types represents a different kind of one-sidedness. And the attitude is a readiness of the psyche to act or react in a certain way. It's an automatic phenomenon. 
and its automatic nature is the cause of the one-sidedness. So it's not like, oh, you're a dominant uh, thinking type, therefore you're one-sided. He's saying that it's the automatic nature of it that leads to one-sided activities, one-sided attitudes in life and about oneself or one's environment, automatic reactions. And then this is lovely. He says at the end, a conscious capacity for one-sidedness is a sign of the highest culture, a conscious capacity. So it's cool to be your type as long as you're conscious that that's what you're doing. But involuntary one-sided, the inability to be anything but one-sided, in other words, to use your dominant function when it's not appropriate, um, this is a sign of barbarism. And I love that we, we've, uh, in, in this language here, we've inherited some Victorian terms like high culture and barbarism. And, um, you know, to say of somebody who has the unconscious use of type that they're a barbarian, that's, uh, you know, we don't do that at type conferences, but we could. We could speak of those who aren't type knowledgeable and they're barbarians. And I sort of like that thought. But it's, uh, it's uh, you know, that shows the benefit just of learning about type for the first time is the, the ability to become consciously uh, aware of our preferences and then when we're and how we're using them. So one-sidedness with oneself and in life uh, circumstances parallel each other. And, and we're going to see more quotes in the next slide when he talks about society and behavior in the outer world. And, and I love this little seesaw. And uh, if we had time and really unpack the metaphor, it's a great choice because the, the as I look at it, first of all, the, the, this little teeter-totter here, this balance is actually not balanced. It's the, even the board itself is not in a, in a central spot. It's designed to, to give uh, even some head start to the donut, but the donut can't make use of that little bit of extra distance it's given. Uh, also, the, the apple, not just being healthy and organic, has a core, and the core have seeds, and the seeds are what is allowed, it's part of the whole life cycle of the tree that allows us to create more apple trees. In contrast, the donut doesn't have seeds, it has a hole. It has emptiness in the middle. And we can view this as, you know, what do we do with our type knowledge? And we're all aware of people who, especially in maybe a corporate environment, who learn type and then just sort of use it to do test and tell. This is your type. We're going to assign you to a team or a position or something that's sort of a little bit sketchy sounding. And, and the seeds are missing. And so even our use of type, hopefully, is going to be more like the apple than like the donut. Um, and I have a little side thing about that. Is I, normally, I can't eat donuts because they have eggs in them in America, and I'm allergic to eggs, uh, lifelong. But I was so delighted when I went to Germany last summer, and the donuts there don't have eggs in them. So I, it looks very delicious, I have to say. It's tempting, isn't it? But uh, especially in the afternoon for you all, in the morning for me. But the apple is the healthy choice. And that's what we're going to do today is the healthy choice. Okay, don't worry, the, the, whole, the, the whole thing is not filled with quotes. It's just for this morning, we're going to have some quotes uh, at the beginning. Uh, and Steve Myers picked these out. So this is really how it's showing up in the rest of our lives. It says, if I had to name the most essential thing that analytical psychology can add to our... And Doris, could you help me out with that long German word? Uh, unsere Weltanschauung, how we view the world. How we view the world. Great. And could you say that again? I didn't quite catch that. Weltanschauung. Weltanschauung. Okay. Weltanschauung. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And then now, now when I try any European language, I add a Norwegian accent accidentally to it because that's what I've been studying. So it's, uh, but yeah, so there's, there's our word. Our, and it would be, uh, he said, I, I should say it is the recognition that there exist certain unconscious contents which the conscious mind must come to terms, uh, whether it will or not. So he's saying we must do this, but we might not. And later on, when he talks about the, the transcendent function, he describes it, it begins as an unconscious process, but ultimately the, the sort of football is handed over to the ego. And the ego has a choice of whether to do something with it or not. Um, and he says, conscious and unconscious do not make a whole when one of them is suppressed or injured by the other. Both are aspects of life. So we could say in learning about type dynamics or development for the first time, oh, I have more conscious functions and then these unconscious functions. 
and, and that's my type. And he's saying, no, that actually doesn't make the whole person to just have them separate. Uh, that really there's this individuation process that in the course of development, uh, that there's conflict between these two. And that conflict can show up in the outer world very easily. For me, for example, it's, uh, you know, what I deal with the outer world is extroverted thinking. So it's business-like and it's time and task and I'm compartmentalizing interactions and it is sort of this objective and personal process, uh, which I love, by the way, and, and works for me, but it's not extroverted feeling. And so in interpersonal situations uh, or even in, in non-personal situations, have I stopped to consider other people's needs and values and say making a business decision? So there's this a conflict can arise as other people feel like they've been left out or slighted or something like that. So the, the effects of our using the functions are not show up in everyday life. And he said, it's impossible to convince anybody that includes all of us in this room. It's impossible to convince anybody that the conflict is in the psyche of every individual since he is quite sure where the enemy is. In other words, the problem is always outside of us. That, that Joe, the ESTJ, or Mary, the INFP, is the source of, of this particular conflict we're having. Um, and he says, therefore, the conflict takes place by projection and in the form of political tension. And he, does, he was thinking at this time about, you know, politics, and truly in the sense of politics, um, but also meaning, you know, like office politics or the politics in the family. And, and so there's this, this drama that goes on and there's this activity of projection that things that either we idealize or we really dislike, we're projecting onto other people. And uh, it could be on a very, very wide theater. Uh, an example could be, I guess it's three years ago now when there was the election here in the US and on the evening when Donald Trump won, Hillary Clinton supporters were shocked and in tears here on the news, you could see them, that it just, something happened that was unimaginable as someone, as if somebody had come and killed their mother. And, and so there really was this attachment that had occurred and the hopes and dreams and so on projected. And, uh, you know, Barack Obama was very aware of this, the previous president, that, that he was somebody who received people's projections and, and therefore what do you do with them? So this is something that even though it might show up in the public space very publicly, it can happen between uh, romantic attraction, between employee and boss, uh, between the, the team that you're on, the team members, all of these things, there's projection. So the psyche plays itself out on the stage of society and vice versa. Again, the diamond idea, the diamond reflects the world, the world is reflected in the diamond he said, it is the nature of political bodies that we always see the evil in the opposite group. Just as the individual has an um, ineradicable tendency to get rid of everything he does not know and does not want to know about himself by putting it onto somebody else. So this really, I'm emphasizing this um, because I feel like this is the foundation of why we want to do type development. Otherwise, it just becomes an activity in skill building. And when we talk about the transcendent function, there'll be experiences that, yes, they're skill building, but they're also unpleasant. And if you think back to, I mean, maybe some of you have not had a broken heart, but for those of you who've had, you know, that wasn't a pleasant experience, and yet it was a learning experience. And it becomes a part of the mural of our, our makeup. And it's a growing experience, and there's something that happens there. It's an alchemy that happened, and it was an alchemy that was, in a sense, incomplete and failed, but it was also one that was successful in transforming us. So that's really the motivation of coming and saying, especially for these deeper functions. The third function is something I feel like we all are given opportunities to become aware of and develop. But the fourth function, the fifth, the sixth function, do we really need to develop those, and what does it take? And so uh, alchemy uh, integrates those opposing psychological elements. That's what we're here today to talk about. And I'm gonna read this down here. It says it's two, two wizards, uh, presumably in medieval England somewhere. Um, one says, I'm attempting to transmute calcium oxide, copper gluconate, uh, manganese sulfate, tyrosine, and benzyl 
benzaldehyde, benzaldehyde into a condensed soup. And that really is the challenge of type, isn't it? Because we're given these letters, S and N and the T, I and F, E and so on. And they, they are sort of the elements. They're the calcium oxide and the, the manganese sulfate. But we're asked to turn them into a delicious condensed soup. And how do we do that? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Really, it is a challenge. And so a lot of what you're going to see today are simply examples that are drawn from people's lives, uh, you know, made anonymous and generalized, that are examples of how these elements, when brought together, can create a delicious condensed soup. And what does that look like when we bring them together? The dominant function, uh, we can see sort of on the left there, the heroic ego, and the inferior function, which uh, you know, Jung, Jung associated with the animor animus, the, the inner masculine or inner feminine that's our opposite. Um, or as uh, Richard, you've mentioned some other terms, how it manifests as forcing and accepting. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, and there's an intersection there, the, the green zone. And I say it's some kind of transcendent function thingy. And that's uh, what is the transcendent function? Because we don't hear a lot about it, but it is, it was the focus of psychological types, the book and his work. There's this one-sidedness. Here are these ways that people are one-sided. And then, gosh, we need this transcendent function in, in order to facilitate growth. Because, I mean, he was a psychiatrist with seeing clients after all and wanted to know how do we get people to engage in growth. So what is this transcendent function thingy? And uh, the magic diamond, which we'll be running with, is this alchemical symbol for growth. We'll see an actual diamond later. Um, right now, it's just this, this generalized diamond here. And I was very much inspired. Somebody had sent along or posted an article uh, by a, a psychologist who came out with this stuff on gender, male and female, uh, in the 70s and 80s, and Sandra Bem. And she really believed that instead of masculine and feminine and putting that along a line, that maybe if we made a matrix, uh, she didn't use the word diamond, she was looking at a matrix, but same idea, that, that we turn it around so that of these four categories, one is feeling and what is thinking, and then the other two were what? So Jung talked about this, this the beginning judgment is undifferentiated. When the infant is developing and is born, the judgment isn't there or it's there in, in the most undifferentiated way, in a sort of primal way that is, um, I like, I don't like, in terms of crying, it doesn't feel good, whatever, it's taking the, the simple undifferentiated per, uh, perception, feels good, doesn't feel good, and a simple judgment, like it, don't like it. And, and then we see feeling and thinking as two dimensions that um, go upward from the base of the diamond. And if we differentiate in the direction of thinking, that's sort of saying, okay, it's like being right-handed, that we're going to develop judgment in, in, towards the right, towards the thinking, in a style of deciding and organizing based on objective or personal criteria, measures, principles, and so on. Or we can be developing feeling, differentiating it more towards the left here, feeling, deciding, organizing based on worth or harmony, with personal group or societal values. And sort of having to juggle all of those, which is not an easy process. Uh, so feeling and thinking begin undifferentiated. They can go in these different directions. And then there's a fourth square. So we're reminded not only can, do we have thinking and feeling, we have this undifferentiated space. We also have this integrated space, a transcendent judgment. And for, for both perceiving and judging, I really had to look at Buddhism to, to have a sense of what these would look like, deciding and organizing from a core of detached compassion. So the detached compassion, one a person is sort of going through the world, recognizing their own biases and the, the temporary and illusionary nature, the temporal nature of the world. Uh, what is in Hinduism and Buddhism and so on is maya or illusion. 
And at the same time, so there was that, that leads to a kind of detachment. The, and then at the same time, there is compassion in the moment for the people in front of us and what's going on with them. And that those are very real, very present, the fellow souls, fellow human beings looking in the other person's eyes and recognizing this is me and, and I am them. And so that's what we want to find out then. And I love this because when we talk type, if we presented type this way, just hypothetically, is feeling and thinking, it immediately invites people to wonder not just what is my preference, but what does it look like when they work together? It visually invites the reader to think about that, or the, you know, the client to think about that. And there's some quotes here about the, the transcendent function. We're almost ready for part two. And we're, well, even not so far off on time. I'm shocked. Okay. Transcendent function is a way to resolve one-sidedness. Uh, he said the secret of alchemy was in the transcendent function, the transformation of the personality to the blending infusion, blending infusion of the conscious with unconscious. So consider in your practice, have you presented to people what it looks like when sensing or intuiting are blended together. Do we have materials for that? And that's why I really want the materials I sent out to you to be able to say, um, these, are, um, these are for you to use. Yeah, I'm gonna turn them into a book and you know, open it up a little bit more and so on. But in the interim, while we're waiting for that process, why not just you know, go ahead and say, everybody use these materials uh, as you like, so that you can present to clients when it's appropriate, what it looks like when they're blended, not in the sense of undifferentiated, but unique to examples that are unique to that person's life. So the transcendent function is the concept and practice. So it's a practice of a dialogue between conscious and unconscious. Um, and it's through that dialogue that the psyche transforms. This is why we see the transcendent function emerge in the development and discussion uh, of uh, all of the other the key concepts in Jung's writing. So this is somebody commenting about Jung here. Uh, the transcendent function facilitates the transition from one attitude to another. So there's also this is a transition from thinking to feeling. How do we move from one to the other? So even just beyond the, or besides blending and fusion, just the movement itself is the transcendent function making it happen. So you're using your transcendent function all the time or it's using you. Uh, both, neither. Uh, he says it starts when there is a parity of the opposites. So we, we begin with a certain bias and say thinking, but and, and we're interacting with our environment using the thinking function. And then we're going to be, have neglected the feeling function inevitably. And the environment then will then, things will happen that will reflect to the neglect within ourselves as well, psychologically in the unconscious, there'll be uh, elements in our lives, our past memories, uh, issues that we're carrying in baggage that really need the feeling function to be dealt with. And at some point they're gonna rise up and the feeling is gonna be like, hey, excuse me, I, I, need, I need attention. And this can show up as the person crying or having some kind of outburst of opinion or being frozen or whatever it is, or being carried away with some kind of delightful project which seems out of character. Say the ISTP is a suddenly uh, in some kind of you know, very romantic extroverted feeling mode, what happened? Um, he says, this leads to the suspension of the will. In other words, we arrive at a point where we literally, we, we get out of our minds or beside ourselves, to quote Naomi Quank, and uh, we can't make a decision between them is with the head and the heart. With the example of thinking and feeling, and they're both equally strong, what do we do? And he says, uh, since we can't really tolerate a standstill for long, the world won't tolerate it, the psyche will not tolerate it for long, this vital energy builds up. And there's some kind of tension of opposites produces a new function to transcend them. And we might step away from that. We might run away from it or we might embrace it creatively or some other change in our lives. And uh, that, that's what we'll be talking about today and sort of sets the stage or the flavor for um, what it is that we're doing. And that there is this process that happens to us internally. It is us. 
uh, one of the things I love in, in Kundalini yoga, there's a song that is traditionally sung at the end of every Kundalini yoga session. So you go in and do your yoga and all of that for, for 80 minutes. And then in the last 10 minutes to 90 minutes, there's Shavasana, which is you lie down and just sort of relax. Uh, Shavasana means death pose. And that, that's cute because it's implying there's a certain death that happens to the psyche. And then we get up from that and there's a song that's sung traditionally and, and it uses you, not I. So um, may the long time sun shine upon you. Uh, may all love surround you. And yes, in a group, we're singing to the other people, but we're also singing to ourselves. That we're taking this position that who we are, our ego is something that we're singing to and that we're a step above that or beyond that. And, and type already gives us great. It gives us this language to step back a little bit from ourselves and, and, and with others and to grow. And that's now I, I feel like the type community is, is really, and in myself, of course, too, because all of this is a project. I mean, everything we do with type is a project for ourselves too. Um, to really just, you know, take a parade in a way um, out and say, hey, type is about development. And now we're going to get into the part here about the processes and the sixth function. But before we do that, I'd like to open up um, I see that I actually need in order to open up the actually, I would just say this. If you have a question, we'll take question for, for five minutes, four minutes. If you have a question, just unmute and say it. Uh, don't wave your hand because I can't see everybody at once. Hi, this is Doris. Um, when I was seeing the, the diamond, and I don't know if it's a question yet, sorry, you know, I think out loud. Yeah. Um, the undifferentiated judgments that uh, at, at the bottom of it and the baby crying and like or dislike. Yeah. The phrase that I have uh, always in the back of my mind is that Jung stipulated we come into the world with a predisposition to use our brain in a certain way. So does this contradict that not really right because it is yeah. different it's not really tabula rasa because he's still like there's still a, a predisposition can you right right I, I would say you know we we all have um you, you know these genetic features for example that predispose us to to particular diseases to musical ability whatever it is but we need to actually develop those in some what he called definite way in the world like uh you know, Mozart needed to actually have a piano and learn how to play the piano in order to express his musical talent, which was inborn. And that's how I would sort of say what it that's, is. That's a great uh, metaphor analogy. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? A question? giving introverts a moment to rummage around in their minds. And there are some wonderful existing resources on, on type dynamics um, and depth psychology. Of course, John Beebe, who will be speaking on Sunday, um, and his, uh, his books. I'm so happy in the past few years he's come out with some books and uh, before that, well before that, there were Naomi Quank and others who uh, talked about type development and what it looks like. Linda Behrens and myself, uh, looking at each of the functions. I imagine all of you have some projects. I know Richard, you're working on a project right now and that's, um, that will be, it's about type development as well. And I really, again, I believe that that's where the strength of type lies for this going into the future. Uh, it, yes. Okay, real quick. Um, so using this so looking using this and then looking at naomi quank's work i mean does that then shed a different light on her work in terms of you know why we end up getting into the grep or you know if we if we look at it through this transcendent function and the tension there and then that maybe sheds a better light on how those situations happen because mm. i mean you can either transcend or 
I mean, if you're in the grip, maybe you're stuck and you can't transcend. Is that kind of where yeah. you see this maybe going? Yes, yes. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm glad you bring this up. Thank you. Because for one, Naomi Quank has specifically said when asked at the, um, was it at the Dallas or San Francisco conference? I think it was at the San Francisco conference in 2011. When asked, uh, she said she did not find use for BB's work and the, the fifth through eighth functions that she was really solidly in the camp that every person has four and only four functions and they just differentiate 10 to in different ways. And so there's a little bit of a difference there in terms of addressing what's what. And then the second thing I would say is she mostly focused on dysfunction, which is understandable because she's a psychotherapist, and, and what that looks like when we get stuck. And what I would like to do here is to continue with Isabel Meyer's focus in a way on the positive and say, uh, you know, most of us are not therapists, I don't think, in the room here. Some of you probably are. But, you know, when we do coaching or something, we want to recognize when somebody's in the grip uh, when shadow function stuff is, is happening. But we also can give people examples of how to move forward. And, and I'm a great proponent of giving case studies and examples and saying, hey, here are places you can go to rather than just, oh no, you need therapy for the stuff that, that is unresolved. So there's a little bit of a difference. I think it's really important to recognize when we're in the grip or something like that. And as part of that process, we can also just get into the alchemy lab and start the lab work right away in a very proactive sort of positive way. Let's begin actively transmuting and, and working on some part of ourselves, even though we're not going to quite know what we're doing. Yeah. Wonderful questions. Thank you. So let, let's actually make this real. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to do in part two. Um, and, uh, this is one of the handouts, and you don't, you don't need to look into this. You can if you want to. Um, and it's, uh, how do you want us to use the chat box and questions as they arise? Uh, oh, no, this is further down here. Thank you for the introduction. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for great questions. That's what I love about this group. It's a uh, tight community is marvelous. Uh, so we, the, these are just recaps, descriptions of the functions. And, you know, everybody, everybody has their, uh, you know, their favorite source material and their favorite authors. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I, I know lots of people on the internet, young people are working on their own function descriptions, and that's part of their own process of understanding the functions. The ones I use here, and I've given this to you as a handout, you're free to use this as well. The only real difference is, is that they're based on my neuroscience work. And uh, Isabel Myers said uh, towards the end of Gifts Differing that every single one of the functions was involved the mind. Sensing was a mental function, not just a, something physical, which we might think of for sensory, that it involved using our minds. And so I really think about that when, in writing each of the functions and that they're also passive and active form for each of them. Um, that you know, sensing is not just as passive intaking from the five senses, but it involves a instinctual response with the body, uh, with emotions, with the mind to what's going on. So passive and active of each. So you, you can just use that or not. Uh, for people who would be you know, new to type, um, I have used this and you can ask me if you want to later. I've used this as an introduction to type, uh, but I have follow a very particular process because I think normally the eight functions is not a great way to start off people with type but it can be when done, when done carefully, which also involves, I, I really feel, sorting out of cultural stuff. So just know that this is here as a resource that I sent you. Uh, and it also has two other pages that introduce the person to the brain and neuroscience connects that with type and then an activity. Um, so we have that. And, and, but what we're going to focus on is this doorway to wisdom. Uh, that's what I call the sixth function. And uh, I don't even remember what inspired that phrasing. Uh, I, I, perhaps it would be, uh, I feel lucky that I had uh, advisors uh, in my PhD program, in my life, um, 
who really pushed me to develop what is my six function. So as someone with INTJ preferences, for me, that would be introverted thinking. And, and that was definitely something I go back and remember in my university years as a, a, a process I really disliked. You know, I would have INTP professors, likely INTPs, uh, who I just found so irritating because they would not give examples. They would just throw up some principle onto the board and say, see, see, and then give us problems without any examples. And I found that incredibly frustrating. But since then, it's sort of been hammered into me uh, and given some wonderful guidance on how to take a principle and apply it to any situation, to take a definition and how to be very flexible and finding leverage in situations and how to apply it. And that is, uh, I really found since then it also, introverted thinking became a way to organize all of my extroverted thinking ideas in a way that was coherent. And it was that coherency that then would bring an element of wisdom to my life. Now, what is the six function? Uh, I'll give a brief example, but no, you don't actually need to know this when we do the activity because it's all laid out easy. But to find your six function, you look at your auxiliary. So if you have INFP preferences, then your auxiliary is extroverted and intuiting. Uh, but it's the opposite attitude. So then it would be introverted and intuiting. Or if it's extroverted thinking, it's going to be introverted thinking. Um, if you're INFJ, instead of extroverted feeling, it will be introverted feeling. Uh, the handout, however, guides by the type code. And the idea is that when we reject the six, we often do that, and you'll read examples in youth, but we find a unique way to elevate it into our lives, uh, hopefully. But again, that's not necessarily something that happens. So for me, it was going to university. For other people, it's, it's other things in life. Um, the result is either balancing a strong perception. So as an INTJ, and this is gonna be the same for ENFP and ESFP, other types which are dominant perceiving types, dominant function is sensing or intuiting, that he gives more diversity of judgment. And for those folks who are dominant judging types, like ENFJ or INFP, ESTJ, with a dominant thinking or feeling, that it brings more diverse perception. And so that's really what we, here, we're not even talking so much about a transcendent function yet. This is just to, to warm up. Six function is like a warm up. What does it look like when we just diversify uh, how we function? So this is the, the handout. Uh, if you could take a look at this here, pull that up, or if you printed it out, and you'll see it's the one that it, it begins with wisdom of the Senex, which role in your life. And it's called the Senex, or which John Beebe calls it that, um, because it can appear as, uh, as a bad parent. That it's this critical voice uh, that we encounter in the world and that we sometimes produce from ourselves, seemingly out of nowhere. And, and how, do we, how do we grapple with that when we encounter the bad parent? And the pages are organized into eight categories here. And so in the, the upper left on the first page, it's ESTJ and ESFJ. And both of those types um, are going to be, they're grappling with extroverted sensing. So if you're ESTJ or ESFJ preferences, for our little uh, reflection and sharing activity, you'll be looking at that one. Then you see the types otherwise grouped, say when INFP and INTP, are called to, and this is introverted intuiting, to transform with the meta perspective. I, I didn't put all of the type code stuff there, uh, but I, I think most of you will know what those are and, and what's important is the content in any case. Uh, and then on the, the next page, scrolling down or you turn it over, uh, ESTP and ENTP um, and, and so on. And it gives some examples of when it's neglected and then when it is brought in and, and accepted and integrated. And they're also sort of, uh, they're grouped into these broad categories at the top too, four broad, broad categories like, uh, but you know, I, you know, IJ and, and uh, EP and so on. So the four different type, but don't worry about that. That's just, you know, for, for extra, it's for extra. 
So instructions is find your type code among the eight categories on the foldout, read what your type Senex or which looks like when rejected, often earlier life and when it's accepted, often later. Uh, consider your own life, similar areas of one-sidedness. So essentially this is a reflection piece and ways that you might diversify how you operate. So it, for all of us, we've probably incorporated the six functions some ways in our lives, in a few ways, one or two, uh, but probably could do more. So just identify what those look like. Um, and the example I like to use is from a, a type colleague who teaches martial arts. A student goes to the martial arts master excited to be taught the way. However, the new master is harsh and the student is quickly angry or discouraged by the bad parent, the harsh teacher. Yet over time, the student comes to understand the master and discovers the wisdom that comes through martial arts. And that's sort of the metaphor that we're working with. So let's uh, do the, I'll give you, you know, um, actually I left quite a bit of time for this. So it's, uh, we'll spend the maybe seven or eight minutes. So let's say seven minutes reading through your type and then just uh, jot down some notes or think about uh, anything that you'd like to take away from it, how it's shown up in your life uh, or what you'd like to share with the group as examples. And they could also be examples you've seen in clients uh, as well as yourself, if you like. And we'll just do that now as a group. Two minutes.
Okay, let's come back together. And um, who might wish to share either a um, personal example or example from a client or family member to give us all of a sense of, uh, you know, that's the great thing about coming together when we know our type is that we can hear from people who are type alike or type different and, and get our different perspectives. I can share. If, oh, thank you. I'll start it off. So I'm an ESTJ and my sixth function would be extroverted sensing. Um, ways I can see, uh, see it being rejected is rejecting new experiences, staying at home, not, not engaging, or sometimes I, I really, I'm a, obviously TE, so I like to engage people mentally. Um, which is not always appropriate. People don't always want to get into a big, like, you know, mental discussion. Um, so that's kind of ways where it shows up in not a good sense. Um, uh, and one thing I've learned as I've gotten older is that really that extroverted sensing is a great stress reliever. It kind of gets me out of my head. And if I'm outside gardening or I'm walking or I'm exercising, it's a way to kind of just be present. Um, I kind of have a hard time meditating, being a T dominant person. Uh, that's very difficult for me. So sometimes that physical activity is sort of a meditation in and of itself. Or like if I went swimming, that kind of gets me in the here and now. Um, diving for me is that way. Mm. I'm really present when I'm diving, but you know, so I'm learning to do to do that a little bit better and and maybe could be an opportunity for me to engage with people since I don't have strong extroverted feeling um, in a way that might be more appropriate. So that's, that's kind of some ideas I had. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, sometimes we, there's a little bit of pigeonholing that can happen saying, Oh, stress relief always happens through the third function or something like that. And, and, you know, I really believe that whenever we engage the shadow functions, they may be a source of stress, but they can really be uh, very relieving too, you know, to just take a break from how we usually operate. And then extroverted sensing by itself, because it's such a contrast to STJ society, sort of work society, that it's like, oh, yeah, so just to get out. And um, yeah, the, the scuba diving and snorkeling, I did that for nine days once a few years ago. And I was so relaxed afterward that trip and this was in the south pacific it took me two months to get back into a work mode so it was uh <laughs> but it was very relaxing yes i can sympathize thank you anyone else like to um to share i'd like as a intp the exact opposite um i've and i am a christian i've gone to church and i believe in the bible i use my introverted thinking and I found it very frustrating and difficult that I didn't have any experience or sort of spiritual experience and however you describe it. Mm. And over time, and particularly being out in nature and just being, and gradually I get these sensations in my body which sort of say this is real because it's not the sort of thing I would usually do. I might have tears or get excited or something. And then, so it's, Yes, using my inferior, um, what, what is it, the NI. Yeah, yeah, the, the yes. shadow NI. Yes. yes. And okay. In a way, I, I'm quite envious of people who can use it a lot, but because I, I don't. But it, it's grown over time. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. It's, um, I, I'm reminded that uh, I know a number of people, one my cousins, for example, is INFJ preferences, so dominant introverted intuiting. And he really finds that hiking or just going out in nature in some way, usually wanting to go back to home or to the hotel at night, but hiking during the day is such a spiritual experience. And, and some of that might think, oh, well, hiking is extroverted sensing activity, but it also very much is, it can be an introverted intuiting activity because we're digesting our experience 
And, and introverted intuiting also needn't be just images in the head. It can be quite uh, a gut experience too of the sensation of something. And that's the feeling of something, which is very moving. It has that spiritual dimension to it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And um, we have time for a couple more. Um, hi. Um, hi. So I'm an ENFJ. And so I want to kind of contrast what you said as an INTP. Because um, for me, um, you know, I prefer NI. And when, uh, for me, I would say I definitely feel that sort of get to the point, like with NE users sometimes. Or if I'm in a meeting, um, I might want to like cut people off and make sure like we're bringing it back to like what people care about and things like that. But mm -hmm. I'd say too, for me, especially with uh, this whole virus thing going around, I'm really having to embrace the unknown because there was a lot that I anticipated would be about to happen and stuff. Um, and like, I need to kind of chill and let myself know that I don't know what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. So literally, even for me, I've had before my New Year's resolution to be, uh, to remember to have more humor because I did do improv and comedy in high school. So that's a part of me. But sometimes I forget, like, as I've developed my NI growing up, I can get so serious. So even it's just like, hey, remember to watch TV and look at someone else's story, get outside, you know, your own NI and think about, you know, some other possibility that is really healing for me and allowing me to be like more playful and fun with things. So, yeah. <laughs> Get out of the serious self. That wonderful, thank you. And that's um, uh, you know we might think of humor as is just sort of like a, you know quip or or comeback or something like that banter. But what you described is that when when we take things seriously, which I can understand as a fellow NJ type, it's very easy for me to be in the serious mode. That just to relax about it really says yes, humor is possible. And, and that's, um, it's very freeing that way to just get out of that serious mindset. And I love how you described too, that it's using extroverted intuiting to say, or, or ask how are other people going through this or experiencing this? Cause it actually complements your dominant function. So it's not like, oh no, this is extroverted intuiting is competing. It, it ultimately is, it's, uh, you know, the dominant function, extroverted feeling does its thing as judgment and then you're adding another way to perceive and that actually well then as a perceiver it's not directly competing it's adding yeah wonderful thank you and very very timely example too yeah um sorry who was that lady speaking just now megan hi megan yeah, fellow ENFJs, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, if I just might tack on on that. Um, I also have ENFJ preferences, and Megan, what you said, super resonated. <laughs> um, and the notes that I took that I wanted to add, Daria, when, when we were in Dallas, um, you mentioned the sixth function to me in a way of uh, the, the critical parent and how it might show up, especially in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I uh, am married to uh, someone with INTP preferences. So he is trying to be helpful by giving me ideas and possibilities and things that I could be doing with my business. And I hear it on the critical ear. And so if everyone's familiar with, you know, Linda Behrens' interaction styles, for example, I find that really in line with the in charge uh, pattern because he's reminding me of all the things I haven't accomplished yet. So, um, yeah, but at the same time, having awareness of it, I, you know, we now have a language and I know that he's not criticizing me, that he's trying to be helpful. So if I am in the receptive mood, um, I appreciate his input and, you know, take a moment to think about his ideas and then maybe use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, thank you for adding that. And um, yeah, when you mentioned something I had said, I'm like, oh gosh, what did I say? because uh, I usually don't remember those things. <laughs> but um, the, the receptive mood, what, what a great phrase, because when we get down further in, you know, 
from from the second function down to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on, that I believe that it takes a special situation, what you call like a container, or as you described it, a receptive mood, is is when it's the right time to do that. So it's okay to have patience and sort of forgiveness with ourselves and others when they're working on maybe be more open to the sixth function because it's not going to fit all the time. And, and I, you know, I would say for myself, my sixth function is where it plays out is often right. I mean, with type and with work is where it's easiest because that's where I learned it. I learned it in sort of academic setting. And so it applies to my work and thinking, do I go around in life from moment to moment looking for leverage points and applying principles uh, and definitions? Uh, I would say no. Uh, but over the years, it's as, as a kind of practice or habit, it's gotten a little bit wider in scope. And, and I do need to, you know, I have a limit to how much introverted thinking I'll tolerate. And am I in the mood to entertain it is... Uh, is great because it's it very much is about time and place um the the more the the, the function is in shadow yeah we have one more from someone one more comment or something you'd like to share so we have nt sj nf do we have any uh, sensing perceiving types in the group? Maybe not, okay. I actually did invite an ISFP to come and he was going to come and then he looked at the sample handout and he's like, oh no, this is too much for me right now. So it's um, almost, almost had an SP, almost. Okay, thank you so much for, for um, those of you who shared and, and for those of you who are listening and present as well. It's, um, and in identifying something, even as something small, I feel that's really great because in that saying, yes, type development is something that's already been happening and it's not just work ahead, um, that in fact it can be a source of relaxation and and that we've already been working on that process maybe for many years um and uh, i see jennifer i uh, you would love to share but my kiddos are up and very active okay well hopefully there'll be um uh an opportunity with some of the later ones but thank you for offering jennifer okay let's take a look at um the synergy of opposites. And this is where we'll be spending uh, the next, um, I don't know, well, until tea time, essentially. And uh, let's, let's take a look at these here. So it's the, the handout that starts power up with the synergy of opposites. I might still change that title a little bit. It's a, maybe a little bit too uh, intuiting judging with the language there. Uh, and millennials love this leveling up phrase. So maybe that's what it's about. And, and again, there are these eight categories. And instead of just one for your type, you're going to find two that fit you. So they're organized by TJ and TP on the first page at the top. When thinking, find synergy uh, with a feeling. Um, and when we can bring in some kind of compassion, empathy, or emotional intelligence into our decision-making process. And so the TJ types and, and TP types. And the TJ types, for some of them, this, this uh, feeling will be, will always be introverted feeling, but it will be the third function. And for others, it will be the fourth function. And for the TP types, similarly, extroverted feeling will be third or fourth. And then you look further down, you see FJ and FP, uh, when feeling finds synergy with thinking um, and, and what that looks like. So all of you will be one of these four in your type code. And then on the next page, it's the same with sensing, it's synergy with intuiting, and intuiting is synergy with sensing. And all of us will be one of those as well. SP, SJ, uh, N, NP, and NJ. And if you want, you, you can see through those and sort of think which one is my third and which one is my fourth. 
but I realize for most groups of people uh, that just knowing their type code is usually what's helpful and then they have a spot to look at. And these are organized a little bit differently. They don't have neglect and accepted. They're just, I, there were so many examples from listening to people that uh, they're, they're just examples and that's it. So get up, get the, the power up with Synergy fold out, find the two categories that fit for you. So if you're INFP, it would be FP and NP. Um, there'll always be two corresponding to your dominant and auxiliary functions. Next, read the example activities under one of those. Just pick one. And, um, they're, they're, and, and if you're not sure which one to pick, just go with the first page. You know? So that would be the, the judging function. And there are ways to empower your life. There are examples. But of course, your examples may be, may be quite different or probably to some little bit variation from there. Uh, and then again, brainstorm ways you have empowered your life. Uh, you look like you or where you can create open space. In other words, that open space is like the container that we're using in alchemy that we need to allow space for something to happen that encourages this resolution of opposites. And then we'll come back and share. And again, it's like, oh, we'll give about five, seven minutes and uh, we'll come back. And for those of you who need to refresh your tea, that's probably a good time to do that too.
Okay. One minute. Okay, let's come back together. See all of you still want a few moments, all good. I'll give one more minute. Yeah. Okay. And uh, no, we, we will be continuing with this handout. So you'll have more time to look at it over the coming, well, until the end of the hour, at least. Who would like to um, share a little bit of either their own experience or uh, in people they know? Just unmute yourself and then um, move this over so I can see. Or if somebody wants, you can type a message as well, but muting is easy. Sure, I'll, I'll toss something in there. Uh, some, I'm, this is David, uh, INTP preferences. Uh, I was looking at the NP, the uh, extroverted in, intuition. As far as stabilizing with a standard, um, I worked at, worked as a bookkeeper for a while, and I supervised a bookkeeper. When you're doing bookkeeping, like you really want to put things in the same accounts over and over and over again in the same exact way. Mm. And it's really not my strength. My brain kind of goes to to sleep, and then I make make mistakes, and then I've got problems that I can go problem solve, and that's kind of exciting. And uh, what I found when I worked with a bookkeeper, uh, particularly like an ISTJ bookkeeper who loved to have that standard, we set up like this policy and procedure, like this is how everything is done. And you know, she would often be very happy just putting things in the same places, but then would run into trouble and couldn't reconcile some of the, the accounts. And I'd break out a spreadsheet and we'd work together and we'd solve things and then she'd be off on her own. So that was, it was kind of a nice compromise. Um, and then I also worked in IT and, and one of the guys I worked with was, was made a point, he was also an ISTJ. He said, uh, you just always do things the same way. Like even if you're gonna mess it up, just mess it up in the same way every single time. And then when we wanna go fix something, we know we just need to go back and fix everything. Whereas I was always like, well, like, hey, today's Tuesday, let's solve this problem this way or that way. Or I've got a new way of doing this. But I learned like, yeah, there was some real value to having all of our clients on the same solution all the way across the, the board. Mm -hmm. and, and I can see how that would, thank you, and, and I can see how that would bring in uh, your dominant function because you, there's that setting up or designing a system in the first place. Like, do we actually have the categories, uh, the right categories for what it is we're doing? And what kind of process do we want to engage in? So it becomes... Uh, a sort of, it becomes a design scenario and there's probably some tweaking that happens along the way. And, and 
another great example of where the six function complements the dominant function by by giving it not only something to do but then eventually making things easier mm. yeah. yeah and so that's a really good point that was there was a real uh, affinity there between nts and sjs that i'd never seen before and that nts like to design systems and sjs like to be in systems mm -hmm. uh, like oh okay like we've got a pairing here that we can work together yeah, yeah, and that's and that's something at the temperament level too. That um, uh, you know, both NTs and SJs value structure. It just is abstract conceptual structure, or is it you know logistical sort of concrete to definite structure? And uh, as long as each person is allowed to do what they do, that that can work very nicely. Yeah, uh, it probably the reverse situation where the NT has to operate under a poorly designed hodgepodge system made by multiple SJs, uh, that, that that would, and no power to change it, that would probably be pretty unpleasant. Yeah. It, as much so as the, the uh, SJ wondering why the NT keeps redesigning stuff. Yeah. So yeah, de definitely temperament continues to, to play in there as well. Thank you. And uh, anyone else like to share? Uh, Dario, bear with me because this is sort of a, a half-baked idea in my mind, but um, I was sort of focusing in on the intuiting, synergizing with sensing and just reflecting a little bit on my journey into meditation and how unifying that is for just body, mind, and spirit, um, but also noticing that um, whatever opening is happening in the perception is a little confusing to me because I'm re-encountering the world in ways that I, I don't really know how to manage. Um, and, you know, my mother was a very, very strong extroverted feeler and I'm just starting to kind of encounter pieces of me that don't feel like my own and disentangling those things from functions that feel like they need more space. Mm. Oh, you know, that, that's, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, so I, I talked about my university experience of, of learning my sixth function, but for many people, not the majority, but a good number of people, they're going to be not just getting examples, but receiving pressure from a parent who exemplifies that sixth function. And uh, I, I think actually of my mom and, and my sister, and uh, for my sister as ENFP, it would be extroverted feeling as her sixth. And my mom is ENFJ preferences, so doing extroverted feeling all the time. So my mother, my, my sister received these versions or expectations of her sixth function from birth, basically. And then the question as we go in later in life, how much of that is, is chosen to make it our own. And I really believe that's true, that the deeper down the, we go in from, from first to eighth, the more the function needs to be tailored to our own experience. Um, and uh, that is, is uh, I, I think is really, um, is really important because we're gonna pick up those examples of the six function and maybe they don't fit for us. And that's, uh, ah, yes, thank you, Mina, for the message, great. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, when, when it doesn't match. And then what you were talking about actually was like almost seventh function stuff. And, and we're gonna get to that at the end. And um, I, I find that the seventh function and eighth function trying to incorporate that in our lives can be incredibly disorienting and that there are safer ways to, to do that, which is why I don't cover it in the same way that we're covering the, the sixth function or a third or fourth. Uh, really um, is a different domain. Dario, I'd like to uh, offer an example. Julie Gross, another American. Um, I'm an ENFJ, and I've always um, been a bit fearful of extremely physical activities. Um, like skiing or water activities, which go very quickly and where I feel like I'm losing control. And I think this was one of the points of, um, 
of conflict and, and lack of understanding with my ex-husband who was an ISTP. So it polarized the situation because he totally embraced all of what I call the ing sports. It's hiking, climbing, kayaking. And I was always, you know, I would become more terrified because he was had such a lack of understanding. Mm. But then my son, who is very kind, um, when we went away on vacation, I had the opportunity to go sailing with him. And my initial response was terror. But then I thought that I'm going to go with it and just embrace it because he's so supportive of these feelings. And so um, it was an exhilarating experience to conquer um, that kind of resistance to those sort of activities. Mm. Oh, that, that's really beautiful, thank you. Uh, that, that it's not an example I thought of, but it's so, uh, it is so true. So there it's in your dominant function, extroverted feeling, there's this meeting the need of being supportive of your feelings. And by doing that saying, hey, it's okay then to do this sort of third function extroverted sensing stuff, which is not the quiet, easy extroverted sensing like gardening that might be more contemplative. Uh, I can entirely sympathize. Uh, years ago when my brother and I went to the Mediterranean, uh, to Greece, and he has ISTP preferences. Uh, he, we, we rented mopeds, or rather he rented a moped. He asked me if I wanted one, and I said, no, I'm probably going to be killed. Uh, and, and in fact, some tourist gets in an accident on average every single day there in the hospital. And I really had to, to trust him um, to riding on the back. And we were actually almost hit three times over the course of the day, but because his, his reaction speeds were so fast, uh, he avoided all of it and he had not ridden a moped in years. So, the, you know, I needed my own needs met. In this case, it's like I knew he had this history of being very good at physical activity and speed and, and could handle that. Um, and, and so that's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that this is the way you described it, that in order to do something, sometimes even the dominant function in its heroic mode needs like a little bit of love and support. To <laughs> say, yes, we, we can do this. Thank you. Still have a couple minutes for this, anyone? Any of you Brits would like to volunteer? We've heard a lot from the Americans. <laughs> no, it's we're it's so, we're so extroverted. It's definitely encouraged by our culture. <laughs> I, I think so because when I did this training in Sweden last summer, I was the only American in the room, and the, the rest were all over Europe. And when we did our very first feedback in the group, there's 30 people, and no one raised their hand to say anything. And finally, you know, I said, "I'll go first. And then some person later from Germany or something, uh, no, Netherlands, he, he was like, oh, it was so nice. He's like, at the beginning, you were so American. <laughs> I'm like, somebody needed to break the ice. I don't know. <laughs> I was, Can I ask something, Daria? Hello? I was going to say that my ISTJ husband, we were traveling in Africa in a coach and he was quite convinced that the coach would fall off the edge of the cliff. Um, and he will always fear the worst. Yeah, yeah, that extroverted intuiting, imagining the different examples. And, and uh, I, I haven't been in one of those, but I can imagine. And um, it, it takes a lot of mental convincing to override what the the monkey part of our brain is telling us is very dangerous yeah. when and if he's cutting standing on a rock, rocky ladder cutting a hedge at the top which is something he's done often he's perfectly happy even mm -hmm. though it's jolly it's still quite dangerous yeah so he's gotten used to it so it, yeah. it's a process of getting used to something that that might be dangerous uh, which that actually is dangerous too um, not, not as much as the other one, but yeah. Yeah, I really, as sharing with his type as INTJ, I would have the extroverted thinking 
telling me statistically, if this were actually dangerous, they wouldn't be driving here because then people would be falling off the cliff every week. Um, but I would be sufficiently terrified nonetheless. And um, yeah, so that really is a nice synergy that, that getting used to something with the introverted sensing, being able to, to balance out with the, the extroverted intuiting and that thinking of all these possibilities, yeah. Can I ask something? Hello? Yes, please. Hello, yes. Yeah, um, if you find that you're already doing quite a few of these things, I mean, I'm probably older than most people here, and I know that that can happen uh, as you get older. You know, would that be the way it is that you do just drift into these different ways of behaving anyway? Um, well, I, I would say from experience, uh, yes and no. So I, I do agree with the age part that life will allow us more opportunities. And certainly with midlife, um, you know, I think back now compared to age 40. So over the course of a decade, I've incorporated a tremendous amount more uh, of my dominant and inferior function working together. Um, there, there was some I was doing even earlier, like uh, creating uh, learning experiences for people using group simulation. So they're live and improv and they're outdoors. And so I was doing a little, but it wasn't personal to me. I was arranging it for others. So sometimes that's something that we can do through our work is we begin by approaching the alchemy by, by demonstrating for or practicing it with other people or for other people and then eventually practice it for ourselves. Uh, and, and so I sort of have to say what Mina said that it, with the meditation and so on, that it took a, a concerted effort to go out and because I, I always hated yoga, uh, <laughs> for example, and now I actually love yoga and I do yoga regularly. I just needed to find the right yoga uh, because Hatha yoga, which is a standard yoga, apparently is a really bad match for me. Um, but there, so that's in that part, I say yes. And the no part is uh, Linda Behrens and I had this great opportunity at the San Francisco APT with a very large gathering um, to try out some of this, uh, what she calls tandem, uh, not to tandem dynamics, the um, cognitive dynamics uh, or intentional styles. And so that's very similar. It's like NFPs and STJs in one group and uh, SFPs and NTJs in another group and so on. So you and your opposite type in the same group. And we had a bunch of INTJs that she tried out material that paralleled to this. And we found a really, um, I think there was 11 or 12 INTJs and it was a very even split between those who said, who looked at this material and were like, oh yeah, we're doing a lot of this. And I was in that group. Uh, and then there was the others, on the other hand, another group, including people in their 40s and 50s, who say, I don't do any of this. And what I found interesting um, is uh, in discussing with them, a few things came up, both discussing during the workshop and then in emails afterwards, um, because I thought, well, maybe I just didn't hit the right examples or something. And and what came up is one is that their jobs did not allow them the flexibility or the room to, to do something with their tertiary or inferior, especially their inferior function. In other words, an INTJ that is shoehorned into a computer programming job, there just isn't going to be a lot of extroverted sensing options. And if they don't take that up in their everyday life, um, meaning that they're doing yoga or bicycling or hiking or rock climbing or whatever it is on the side as a hobby that literally they're just not inviting extroverted sensing into their lives. And where I could see it is I interact with them both in their attitudes, which is something we're going to discuss towards the end. Attitudes is a way to take your daily pulse. Um, and, and just other things they described about their lives that actually that they were in the grip of extroverted sensing, they're inferior at times, with no clear ways to get out of it. And they were aware because they knew type that something was wrong, but they, hadn't, they didn't have the opportunities or maybe taken them 
to, to really do it. So I would say it's wonderful. You know, and we would hope over the course of, of a long life that we would have these opportunities, room to do it. But then I have to be reminded that there are people, for example, you know, I get to travel all over the world until coronavirus. Um, uh, you know, if, if I had children, that would be very different. In fact, I don't even keep pets, not because I dislike animals, but because the pets would be expensive and tie me down to being at home. And I don't want that. So it gives me tremendous opportunity that I can go river rafting in Bali, or I can go scuba diving in Australia, or uh, hiking in Norway, or whatever it is, and, and have these, these extroverted sensing experiences. Uh, but if my life were different and I had different responsibilities, that would not allow that to happen. So there's, uh, and I think it's particularly true for the NJSP types, because there, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, society usually constrains people to be staying in the same place and eats up most of people's hours in the day. And, and there's very little left over. Whereas as people maybe get past when they're at their prime and, and a little bit afterwards and through retirement, maybe more space opens up in their lives for people to do different things. Uh, I didn't want to wait to develop, you know, until I was 65. So I thought, why not now? Um, always why not now? So yeah, I would say it's not necessarily an age thing, although it's just that age gives opportunities and there seems to be something about the brain that pushes us sometimes to develop that, that opposite. Um, well, you, you talked about, um, say, a work scenario where you're in a job all your life and you have to exercise certain functions. What about the other side of age where you grow up in a family? I mean, as simple as you're an introvert, you grow up in a completely extroverted family or, you know, the other way around. You must learn, behave, you must practice behaviours and they must become almost second nature, even though it isn't your preference so that you are ahead of the game in a way. Oh, yes. And, and one thing that really uh, had a huge positive impact for me is that I spent the formative years of my life in schooling. So the first three years of schooling that I did was at a private British school in the Caribbean in Barbados. And that was nice because I got a cultural contrast to America. Um, but beyond that, there was a tremendous amount of physical activity. My stepdad as an ISTP, all of the time, like literally we lived on the beach. So I learned sur surfing. And later on, uh, older childhood, when I came back to the United States, uh, I learned like uh, ice skating and uh, hockey, uh, skiing, uh, th these different physical activities that really feel like second nature to me because they were absorbed in childhood. So every summer as a teenager and in my 20s, I would go and go surfing and, and be in the water and enjoying and having this appreciation for nature. And had I grown up, say, in New York City or Seoul, South Korea, and, and been in a very urban environment and studying a lot, that would have fed some INTJ uh, tendencies or needs you know, in terms of being academic and intellectual and entertaining ideas, but it would have stunted the extroverted sensing. And so I feel very lucky that, that I was exposed to these things, but in a way that was fairly gentle. I mean, that's what I, I love about when we're with somebody who's almost our opposite type, but not quite, you know, where the E and I is the same. So if you're ENFJ, that would be ESTP. If you're ENFP, that would be ESTJ, um, INTP, ISFJ, is you can get exposure to your inferior function, but in a way that isn't too aggressive, uh, that, that isn't too heroic and demanding, that's more flexible. And I find that's a really great way to grow is if, you know, for fellow INTJs is hang around some ISFPs uh, because they do extroverted sensing, but not in a way that's gonna be overwhelming all the time. And so if you have a sibling who is that type or a good friend or even in your workplace, uh, a spouse, of course, that, that really can be a great impetus to growth. Yeah, so really, really great point. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we do have a choice as adults about whether or not to engage things. And when we're children, 
we usually has less of a choice and and it might be for our better so if it's if it's not so much that it throws us off track you know i think that that's a really important um you know it, it, when i lived with my dad's family for a while my dad i stj very much pushed um me to be doing chores at a certain time and and he didn't see the point of anything that was extracurricular that didn't fit with what was needed for me but i watched the show called nova uh, which was on the the public broadcast channel i wanted to see it every afternoon and it's about science and the planets and space and chemistry and all these things and my dad would would come home and see me watching he's like dario you should do your chores now for get ready for dinner, you know, help mom with dinner. And it was great because my stepmother is an ESFP, but she would be like, no, like let Dario watch his show. It's good for him. And, and I really appreciated that, that even though I got a little push to do sensing in, in that side of the family, I was given permission to still do my preferences enough. And that was, uh, you know, those are really great. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's a fine balance. Yeah. It's a fine Thank balance. You. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so many great comments here. Um, oh, yeah, when you're working with somebody of the same type, both, both trying to use your inferior function, um, you know, it can, can you work with somebody else to use it together? Yeah, that's a great example, Megan. Thank you. Um, one of the ways I learned guitar is I tried to learn from an ENFP that was a disaster. I mean, he was a good, you know, good for other ENFPs, no doubt. Uh, and then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to find another INTJ. And I did. One of my students was INTJ, already very good at guitar. He gave me a one hour lesson. Uh, it involves quite a bit of sensing. And the, from the one hour of lesson that lasted me three years because he knew exactly what, you know, he, I mean, that's the magic of, of uh, you know, being, knowing something well enough, but still being able to teach it to really condense it. And this, these are the things you need to know, these five things or whatever it is, and that's it. And, and it was beautiful. So I would say, yeah, that's another thing is if you're wondering how to incorporate something in your life, find someone of the same type. They might be an older generation. They might actually even be younger. Uh, and find out how they're doing it. And because and, they've already mastered it in a way that will work for you. And that's, uh, and Nico also, this is, uh, oh, Megan, right, you, the, the internet has catalyzed opportunities. Yeah, because it, it shows people that there are these, um, there's stuff going on here, for sure. Uh, you know, it, it opens us up that we can go to different places, we can do different things. Whereas when I was young, I grew up in suburbia in the early 80s. And, and, you know, there was no internet or whatever. And all I knew was what was, I remembered my experiences in the Caribbean and I knew what was in my neighborhood. And that was it. And on the nightly news. That, uh, that was it. And um, wonderful comments. Thank you. And... Uh, yeah, you know, this is, this is a great comment. Richard, thank you that in your early 20s, you were doing a lot of physical stuff, but you felt you weren't really in your body while doing them. Um, that's something that, I, that yoga pushes quite a bit. Uh, and I found now music and breath work uh, that is really, it's such a pleasure actually to get into my body, to experience my breathing. And which seems like such a basic thing, but, but really to experience that directly is very nice. Um, and, and as you mentioned here, the Alexander technique, yeah, is also, is an example of getting more into your body. Um, and staying open, thank you, Nico, is very important. Openness to, to trying different things. And uh, yeah, Megan, glad to see you about the breath work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so wonderful comments. And uh, I think we have reached, um, we've almost reached tea time. And what I'm going to do, I know we have our slide here. Oh, there it is. There it is. So we're going to do, um, if we could, uh, you know, like a 10 minute relaxation and tea time, because there's a lot of content and ideas, but I do mean it is 10 minutes. I'm not saying 10 minutes and then we'll come back in 20 minutes, because we're only together for so long. 
So let's just feel free to stretch. It's very healthy, be in our bodies, do some breath work, um, and uh, get some tea, get some snacks, enjoy the sun. I don't know if there's any sun in Britain today. Um, there's not even, no, there's no sun here. It's a very British day today here in Los Angeles. It's completely overcast, but the sun has risen at least. Hmm. And we will reconvene at, um, at uh, what would it be, 4.05. Oh,
Okay, let's uh, find our way back. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I think we just have one or two people who are still out. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. I physically went out into my garden and stretched, only to be greeted by the sound of our neighbor's gardener using his, uh, you know, what is it like? It sounds like a machine gun, but I forget what it's called. The hedge trimmer. It's a disadvantage of being in the city. Okay, so th this next part here is very similar to what we just did. Uh, again, referring to that handout and uh, keeping in mind that there are two categories that would fit. So if you were ESTJ, both the SJ and the TJ were spots you could read. So just go ahead and read the second one, uh, the, the, whichever one you didn't read the first time. Read the example activities, um, they're just examples and sort of brainstorm ways that apply to your life and, and we'll come back and share again with those. So just, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back again in like, uh, four minutes, five minutes.
one minute. Okay, let's um, let's come back together. And uh, who would like to share? In fact, wait, this is a uh, there. Close the door at my end. So same idea, different suggestions and. If you looked at your what would have been your third function last time around, this fourth function ones probably feel a little bit more uh, challenging or distant. Um, or if you did the fourth function before, these will seem probably a little bit more pervasive in your life. And of course, these are just examples. Okay, I'd, I'd be happy to start. So I did my third function this time, which is any. And this is a case where kind of like what you were talking about with your sixth function, Daria, where I, I did my schooling in design and architectural design. Mm -hmm. So, which is all about, <laughs> that is NE like all the time, right? Like you gotta think up something out of nothing, right? You've gotta come up with yeah. something. So I feel like I've accessed that um, early on and I've also, um, in, I, I run a small business and so there's always unexpected things coming up. So I'm sort of forced to kind of deal with those, you know, random possibilities I haven't planned for on a regular basis. Um, so this one actually feels much more comfortable for me than, um, than the fourth function. And we were kind of talking in the chat bar and I do, I, I it's interesting, I use this function in both positive and negative ways. So um, when I get really stressed, I use it to kind of let off some steam. Um, but also when I get frustrated, I use it to sort of um, daydream and get off task. Mm. So it, it shows up not always positively for me. Sometimes I, 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 use it productively and sometimes not. So it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. You know, that that's fantastic that you mentioned both the, the practical aspect of it or the, the helpful aspect, we'll say, and then the, the maybe not so helpful. Although if it's, you know, stress relieving, that is help. And, and there's nothing wrong with daydreaming per se. Um, if, if that's relieving stress and giving a break so that your mind is, is more productive later. But it, it does remind me <clears throat> of something very important to say. Uh, you know, in, in the vein of the way Isabel Myers and, and Catherine Briggs and many others have presented type, that, you know, this really focuses on the positive. And there's nothing wrong with the positive. Like, that, that's great. You know, it's directing people w without fear or criticism or whatnot but you know then we shouldn't think that using these opposites in tandem is always for the best um that in fact if it doesn't if the, the tandem use doesn't respect the the overall life situation of the person then that can be to their detriment so a great example for my own type uh, is if I use introverted, intuitive, and extroverted sensing together and I go on some, say, I mean, an INTJ, say, who's married and has family and a job and all of that and decides to just drop everything and go on a Vipassana meditation retreat for 14 days, 
that unless it's planned for, that can be incredibly disruptive uh, to life. Uh, to even more extreme example, uh, I know an ENFJ who, in pursuit of justice, uh, you know, taught herself uh, legal skills and, you know, embarked on a legal crusade, and she was doing a lot of problem solving. Uh, so there was quite a bit of introverted thinking going on, looking for angles, uh, learning legal principles and all of that in the surface of extroverted feeling. It is, is a justice um, for self and others. And she ended up in the process of doing this, perhaps not appreciating that the legal system, uh, what is it that one judge described to me once? I mean, someone I know, he said, but the, the legal system has already failed if you've entered it. And, and it came at a great cost to her and her life um, because what seemed like a fantastic synergy of dominant and inferior function, and it was. I mean, truly, she got good at what she was doing, but it cost tremendously to the rest of her life. And, and this really goes back to, and we just have one slide on it at the end, but Jung's idea that, that personal growth and he didn't use that word personal growth, but it was the individuation can be quite dangerous. Um, that it may happen too early with respect to our circumstances. Um, that we may end up in the thrall of a particular archetype. And, and in doing that, yes, we'll be amazingly successful in that one thing uh, that we're doing is that archetype, whatever that is. It's like the, the, scientist who, who gives their life completely to, say, the discovery of a vaccine for something. Um, but it can also destroy them in the process. And this is why it's important uh, and, and why there's maybe I diverge a little bit with Naomi Quank and some others and, and would go more with John Beebe to respect all of the functions in their roles. Uh, including the seventh and eighth function, because that ENFJ, for example, and using FE and TI together very well, she really neglected her seventh and eighth functions, introverted sensing and extroverted thinking. Um, and those were not really on her horizon, nor did she bring someone into her life who could compensate and, and help cover those bases. So it really is important to... to you know, in pursuing these to respect the, the whole ecology, all of the eight functions and asking how are they impacting our life in indefinite ways. You know, just running after personal growth by itself might be, we, we might be in the grip of personal growth. And, and that could be dangerous too. So just, and not, not that that directly applied uh, to what you said, but it really reminded me that how important it is to say that. Other comments, things that people would like to share or questions? Kind of a, kind of a general um, comment, I guess, about an image that's come to mind as we've been thinking about this has been the, that of a, of a tennis match and having two players on either side of the net and that, that being like the complementary functions. And the, the whole point is to try and keep the ball in play so that, for example, as a fellow INTJ, uh, my, my extroverted sensing and my introverted sensing gives me more to reflect on and more to, uh, more to bring into that uh, kind of global vision in the introverted intuition. And then that, gives, that should knock the ball back on the, other, on the sensing side of the net again to help me engage with something new that will give greater richness and so on. So you keep it in, in, in movement rather than feeling uh, that it just, you know, kind of somehow you've, you've won the point, it's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's meant to be kind of dynamic, uh, open-ended series of shots from one side to the other the whole time, rather than just getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, beautifully said. And it's, um, yeah, my, my suggestion for all of the NJ types is to go out and do more raw experiences because mm -hmm. each of those raw experiences will add to the database of introverted intuiting and bring new insights and new perspectives in a way that just cogitating wouldn't do uh, or, you know, daydreaming and reflecting. And um, 
And, and it's interesting what you, so also I see there was a Claire wanting a little bit more example of dangerous and working with the opposite. So the example with, um, that I can use for INTJ, but also ENFJ. So that, that ENFJ in doing the FETI, sort of, uh, you know, legal legwork for justice, um, is that she really neglected introverted sensing, which is her seventh function. And she did not have a stable foundation uh, in terms of uh, material security, uh, saving for the future, uh, having people to rely upon who, you know, as J types uh, typically. And she discovered after, not immediately, I mean, it took a number of years, like five or six years, before she really, by neglecting practical parts of her life, uh, and not having the introverted sensing foundation, discovered that you know she was on the verge of being homeless, and so that's what I mean by dangerous. And so was you know succeeding, not not entirely in in her crusade, but you know sort of like seventy five percent. But what fun is that if you're homeless? Um, and and so that really there was that. That's what I mean by dangerous. And for uh, for INTJ, it would also be introverted sensing as the eighth function. But in this case, I think it plays a different role. So with INTJ, uh, if we have, if we attend to what Steve Myers refers to as the product of the function. So you don't have to do your seventh or eighth function, but you need to make sure that the product of it, the result of doing it, somebody is take, helping you take care of that or somehow is being taken care of. So I don't need to do as an INTJ a bunch of introverted sensing, but I do need to make sure that the product of in, ex, introverted sensing, which is having some financial security, material stability, a home base, uh, that those actually need to be there in my life by whatever function I'm gonna use to bring them in. Otherwise, life would just be a series of uh, you know, yoga retreats and uh, you know, scuba diving trips, and and hopping from one job to the next, which could all be satisfying for a while, but then eventually the the seventh and eighth functions will come up and uh, bite one in the butt, and that's uh, so that that's what I mean by it. it can be dangerous, and 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 it's not to suggest we do our seventh or eighth function or we have to do all of the functions but they all have some tangible output. And, and the same for people who have extroverted feeling a seventh or eighth, you know, you might end, the person might end up at a point where they don't have any friends or family. And I, I've seen this a bit in the fifth function role with INFP and ISFP, uh, that due to, to values differences, they cut off their family members. And then, you know, they may also cut off friends who don't meet their, their, uh, you know, sort of the, the align with their values and beliefs, and they end up with no support network socially, which can end up being very lonely. And so they are aligned with their dominant function, and they're probably doing something with their inferior, but in terms of their fifth function, they neglected the product of that, which is community. Uh, the really strong community, not, not just the like, oh, we share some interests, but that, that blood community that tends to be very strong. So uh, Dario, I actually have a quick question about that. Um, mm -hmm. This is Megan, ENFJ. Um, I, kind of, I really relate to how you were describing the FE and TI, how she, it seemed like the lawyer and with the law was maybe trying to crack the code of like, okay, this is what's gonna help people. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing like with typology. And I feel like I, ever since I discovered typology, I've gotten all right at like balancing like NI and SE, FE and TI. But do you think that the sixth function, like, so I relate to not feeling like I have that sort of SI foundation for things. And, you know, I, it's funny you talk about all the yoga retreats and stuff. Like I, I dream of a day where I have the stability, I guess, to then use my SE and go travel everywhere and all that. But like, do you think that we can use the uh, sixth function, like I could use an E to create that stability? Or do, you, or do you think that it's, I guess, possible to use just your top four 
in order to, I guess, get the result of stability without going into the um, other. Right, right. I mean, if, if truly your focus is to create stability, then, then that could happen. Uh, I would say I've seen a pattern with ENFJs that, uh, you know, they chase the rainbow, so to speak, and they're expecting something or they're dreaming of something very conventional at the end of the rainbow, that that's going to happen automatically along with the pot of gold. Um, and I have to say for this ENFJ that I know that she has the same sentiment, that she dreams of the stability and it never happens. How the sixth function could help her, and in this case, she's somebody who did not incorporate the sixth function uh, so much, maybe a little bit in her career in terms of like brainstorming different legal approaches. Um, but, but where it could really help would be, I'm just thinking for her would be to have that relaxation and that humor and that openness and that that openness would invite more people and more relationships, uh, particularly people who could come and support. And because she does not have a spouse, um, who has say introverted sensing as the first, second, third, that, that she's not getting it indirectly either. I mean, and that, you know, that's a great benefit of, of marriage or, or some other, you know, very close kind of relationship where we have a person who can complement our shadow. Um, and, and I would say in your case, you know, it's fine because you're young. And, yeah. but, but, you know, she's older and it's beginning to get to the point where she's wondering like now wondering like, Oh, right. Like I don't have security. What am I going to do about that? Um, and her body is naive to assume that N I and S E together, just doing that back and forth all day could get me the sort of stability I crave or if that's going to just be a constant cycle of never actually getting the stability. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it, and, and it's very difficult, in, in my, and maybe it's a product of my age, and I haven't discovered it yet, but trying to incorporate the seventh and eighth to actually do them as functions, it can feel like we're erasing ourselves because the SI, it comes in and it has the exact opposite of gen, agenda of NI. Dario? And, and, and NI is, is already something you rely upon. This is Harumi. I'm ENFJ, and I actually exactly wanted to talk about that, um, about my seventh function. Hi, those um, Yes. So uh, I've actually found that even more than the eighth, the seventh function for me, SI, uh, has been more difficult. That's the one that I've been, it's so easy to forget. So actually last year and also this year, um, last year I forgot about it, <laughs> but this year I've been a lot more conscious about um, about SI. So that means um, I'm actually starting to enjoy bookkeeping. <laughs> I'm, I founded an NPO and it has about 100 women. And um, I'm also, yeah, I'm trying to create a routine, trying to sleep early. Uh, and I've actually found it to be extremely balancing in my life. It's actually helped my relationships. Um, when I get good sleep, then um, my FI, I, I, I can be aware of my FI and then I can relate to people better. Mm. Um, I used to always change my content all the time, but now I no longer change it and I just keep getting better. So I do it all, I teach it all, mostly in Japanese and my Japanese has gotten better. Um, my, con uh, my presenting has gotten better. So that's why my, my group is growing. Um, and, and I do credit to, uh, to SI, being conscious of SI. And one last thing, mm -hmm. very recently, I, I certified Japanese trainers and there was one woman, she's ENTP and she, actually she, today she quit. She told me two months ago she was gonna quit, but she told me to, she finally announced to the group that she's leaving. And I've been in, uh, I've been in strife about that. I mean, I've been so anxious thinking about her. And then when I, when I accepted my SI in terms of taking responsibility, being accountable, because she was kind of blaming me. And I was like, but you're not doing the work, so it's your fault. <laughs> Don't blame me. But then when I realized I'm, I'm the founder of this MPO, mm -hmm. so it is ultimately my responsibility, that's when my stress disappeared. So I really found that being conscious of seventh is, is so good for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Consciousness of the seventh, I, I would have to say for myself, INTJ is extroverted feeling. Um, 
it, it's not something I do well, but to even occasionally stop and ask, what are the needs of the other people in the room? Or is something diplomatic or not to say? Um, or maybe somebody actually knows better than I do about something. And I can just stop and listen and absorb what their, their viewpoint and their value about it. Uh, that, that it's, uh, you know, it's about like respecting the other person enough to put myself in a one down position. And, and that's very tough and it's not something I would normally do, uh, much less rely upon somebody or even ask someone for help. So those are, um, yeah, it, it can be, and I love how you mentioned it can be in very small things can be helpful, like the sleeping early, you know, which, which touches a little bit on extroverted sensing too. It's like getting a good night's sleep. And this ENFJ, I've used an example. It, it's one thing that I've tried, something now that you mentioned, I keep trying to encourage her because she keeps very random hours um, and doesn't get consistent good sleep and that creates stress. And then the stress creates a, a narrowing of the consciousness that's around the, the ego identity and doesn't allow her to flex. Um, and, and I'm, sometimes I feel like if you just get better sleep, you'll be so much better. Yes. Um, and that's uh, thank you for those exa the example. That's uh, really beautiful. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, um, we're going to go on to the, the concluding portion here and um, some suggestions. Uh, some of it, I, it, they might look a little bit like models, but I don't mean them that way. All right, so here was actually, the, this is, uh, I really loved this little graphic. It was about the seventh and eighth function, but we've already brought it in already. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I believe this is German. But it's, it's, the, it's the devil, the demon chasing the trickster. And that's, uh, you know, what is it that we avoid and ignore these processes? So it was just genius, Harumi, you were saying that, um, you know, you didn't think about it last year, the whole function. And for somebody, for the ESTJ in the room or the, the ISFJ or whatnot, that you wouldn't even think about introverted sensing the whole year would seem sort of unfathomable to them. Um, and it is a challenge because it's competing with our dominant and, and our auxiliary functions. And so we may not attend to it until the end of life or after a project is already done. We think it's done, but oh wait, there's actually more to go. And I do believe that it offers incredible growth opportunities, even if it's brief, uh, that we go and visit there. And an example for me in introverted sensing eighth is just even attending to my heritage and um, who, who are some of the descendants of my family and reading about my ancestors, I mean the other descendants, and, and then reading about my ancestors and what they did. And, and that just inspires my, my dominant function actually, even though it was something that I normally rely upon the ESFJ and our family to know and do these things. Um, seeking input from others who, who have that function. And so one of you mentioned uh, going to somebody um, who, who has, a, you know, their dominant is your, your demonic, your eighth function, and they can give advice that's like completely different and really get you out of something that's stuck. And so that um, can be very, very helpful. I, I, in, in, for, you, for the Americans here, Krampus is, the, is like evil Santa. Uh, and is much more well known in Europe than I don't even think he comes up in America. But he he comes around with the what is it the the bag of coal, or or he collects children who are naughty and puts them in a bag and and takes them away and torments them. So it's uh, yeah evil Santa. So some secrets about the magic diamond and just revisiting that. And these are more like just points to think about. There are several different points. Uh, and I would say use the one that resonates most with you. So I'm going to touch on three or four different things. And whichever one of them resonates most with you as a tool. And remember, you'll have a chance to go back and look at these later with the slide deck. Uh, one of them is change within the developmental context. And so I, I go back to Jung's 
sort of uh, topology of, of the psyche, ego, persona, shadow, the self, the collective unconscious, um, and asking where are you or where is a client or family member right now? And, um, uh, you know, this, this, when the person is very ego based, uh, which I understand from the literature is most common for people in their thirties, uh, because they have enough life experience and self knowledge to know who they are and what works, but they haven't experienced, uh, a lot of the negative feedback. I'm just saying the average person, the negative feedback that comes with repeated failures or the frailty of the body as people get older and so on. So they have this really strong self-awareness, the heroic eye. So that they're competent, they're confident. And, and again, this is not every person. We're just talking sort of statistically a typical person. People, a person could be easily very ego-based in their, their 60s or 70s. Um, uh, maybe a particular president of a, a country comes to mind. Um, you know, they, they have all this and they know that they're biased and they're happily biased and they're very functional. So if I were to use a, a verb to describe them, I would say that they're functioning, that they're speaking, they're thinking, they're taking action, they're doing stuff um, that, that is the evidence of the dominant and the auxiliary and maybe a few other things that have been incorporated wherever they are in their developmental path, the ego is the one that's in the driver's seat at, at, that, at that time in their life. Um, and uh, yes, goodbye, Julie. Thank you for your input uh, and a chance um, to meet everyone in the community. And I really look forward, um, the course there's tomorrow and Sunday and uh, for our actual meeting um, in 2021, again, in person, hopefully. So the, there's this uh, very ego-based functioning. And, and with clients, this can be a challenge because the person is coming in, they're like, I already know who I am and how I work. And they do. Uh, and so the question is sort of convincing them to stretch. And why would they want to do that? Maybe a little bit less common uh, for, for developed adults, but what you could see in, in teenagers or in their 20s, but could be later, is the persona-based, the person who really is enmeshed in the persona, which is a be like them uh, style. So they're trying to maintain acceptable behaviors. They're trying to operate out of things that are their non-preferences. Person has low awareness. They're grounded in a lot of cultural assumptions. They are their roles. And they may be afraid, they know that maybe something is wrong and they're afraid to stretch out. Uh, this could also happen when a person is a minority in a culture or a minority in their organization. Um, and so where you see the person, where their focus, their emphasis is not on functionality because they're not very functional because they're operating out of a space of weakness or a space that's not like them. So but there, there's a lot of focus on display. What is the right language? How do I talk? Um, what clothing do I wear? Um, that, the, the stuff that goes along with the persona. You can also have a person who's caught in a shadow space and you'll know this person because it's existential. They're aware, but they, they're operating from a place of anxiety, uh, confusion, depression, alienation, whatever it is. So th this is almost the opposite of being persona based that, that they're, they've, uh, are, are operating out of their third or fourth or even deeper function for whatever reason, and it's not working out well for them because they don't have the foundation of, of the ego that's strong enough to, to really keep them in a good spot. Because, uh, you know, it's like we're juggling all of these things. The ego is not bad. It serves a very important purpose. Um, and Jung said the ego may be the only part of us that is truly unique to us and, and is our own. So they're caught up in these rejected parts of themselves. And a lot of where their, their conscious awareness is in their experience. Uh, it can show up psychosomatically. It can show up in unwanted emotions. Um, the person is attracted to particular symbols or archetypes, looking for some kind of like uh, psychological health care. And that's the kind of person who would be more likely to come to a therapist rather than to a coach 
but sometimes in the organization, and I certainly encountered this with my students, is that a lot of students that I had were is, is sort of standard student teacher relationship, but some of them were in the shadow space where my suggestion was to send them to the student counseling center and, and there was nothing that I could do for them. Um, they have anxiety in the classroom, not because of me, but because of anxiety, um, generalized anxiety. So that's another space in a person it is, and it may not be a good idea you know, to ask them to be stretching even more into their shadow. But what you could do is if they're doing some things that are shadow-based, they really want to do them, is to help them reach back into their dominant. So the suggestions we've seen here, like NI plus SE, for example, if the person is an NJ type, but they're enmeshed in this SE space for whatever reason, um, what are activities that they can do that can reincorporate their preferred functions? And then this fourth space a person could be in is the self-situated, and this is the really mature person who's really having fun with this and, and doesn't need therapy or coaching per se, except to the extent that they're saying, hey, I'm sort of willingly surrendering myself to this to grow. Um, and they're really taking this, already having this integration as they're coming in. And this can happen when you're dealing with clients who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who, who have benefited, you know, not just age, but have benefited from years of experience and are not weighed down uh, by shadow stuff or too egotistical, whatnot. And so a lot of the focus is on actualizing. So actualizing activities, healing, facilitating, mentoring, stewardship, um, that, that are all in this very healthy space. So that, that's one tool to think about, like not just the growth, but what kind of, what, what is the context for the growth to occur? And, um, we, we could also relate them to, to the seasons of the year. That is true too. Uh, but to keep it simple, I just refer back to Jung's sort of concepts of ego, persona, shadow, and, and uh, the self. And the self also includes the person working a little bit with the, the unconscious actively. Are there any um, thoughts or, or questions about this? I know I could probably do a whole workshop on this. Um, but I'm just mentioning it as a framework for those of you who maybe want to study Jung or, or have studied Jung. Okay, I'll mention a, a second tool that could be useful. Um, and this is uh, a spectrum. So instead of a, a sort of a matrix that we saw before, four different spaces, this is a spectrum. And, and this is uh, specifically related to the transcendent function and the tension of opposites. And the spectrum at the top, Jung said that the, 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 the tension of opposites can result in tremendous creativity. Uh, he mentions why people after midlife crisis, specifically he mentioned people in their 60s, uh, and later why a lot of their creativity can disappear because they've actually resolved the internal tensions within themselves. And while that's led to a certain kind of inner peace, it's also removed the energy that comes from the tension of opposites. And in doing so, that energy was powering their creativity. And the person is now at ease internally, which results in less output externally. Uh, so creativity can be one way that one-sidedness can manifest when there's a strong tension. And that, that's at one end of the spectrum that's very positive. And, and we're going to move then to the other end of the spectrum, which is madness. And, and I remember my grandmother is an ESTJ. Uh, she didn't take a lot of interest in psychology, but she did want to know, you know, she said, where, where is the line between genius and madness? And, and I thought that was a very good question because the genius is in this creativity at one side of the coin or one end of the spectrum and the madness is at the other, where the one-sidedness is so extreme that, that the person sort of has descended into mental illness. Not that that's the only reason for mental illness, not to decrease that schizophrenia or whatnot, um, but that, that is at that other end there. And then there's this whole spectrum in between so before creativity, there might just be this chaos of transformation and progress. 
Um, there might be tension, a person feeling unsorted. Everything is still very functional, they're mature, there's just stuff going on, and they're aware of it, tension and chaos. Then we begin to edge into this place that is very typical for people, but, but not as functional or as pleasant. So lying, so we're aware that there's a one-sidedness, this contradiction, uh, and we're actively trying to deal with that in some way, compartmentalizing it, uh, engaging in compensation, hiding, whatever it is. Um, and, and all of us do that to some extent. You know, the parts of ourselves that don't quite fit the piece, the puzzle piece that like doesn't seem like it goes with this puzzle. Uh, so what do we do with it? We put it in a box over here or we say, no, 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 maybe this can't fit. I don't know. Um, then the sort of being opinionated or easily triggered. Again, the person is still very functional most of the time, but there's this stuff that sort of like when the one-sidedness is pushed a little too far. Uh, ongoing functional compensation. I've just used examples here. When FE uh, shows up as neediness, that could be, by the way, inferior FE. I'm not talking about folks with an FE preference. Um, it could be third, fourth, sixth function, whatever it is, showing up as neediness. NT is this like compartmentalizing and like overly businesslike. Um, whining from FI. Uh, when the person, and this is, uh, you know, the Richard and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, that it could be in the third function. What does that look like? It could easily be in the first or the fourth. Uh, critiquing, uh, which can be, you know, beautifully done critiquing, or it can be done in a very undiplomatic way. And, and it becomes, you know, like the incessant critiquing of everything, like correcting people's grammar, uh, complaining, um, SI, acting out, SE, paranoia, secretiveness. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've become familiar recently with when, when NE is in the seventh position. Oh my, you know, I, I know a lot of folks who are NP types and I, you know, I take for granted at times that while I don't do a lot of NE, I appreciate it. And I don't tend to fall into the, the pitfall of NE. It's something that I appreciate other people doing. But wow, when it's in the seventh position, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, then I'm like really appreciating the ENFPs and INTPs and so on in my life that, that they don't show in that seventh position. But what does it look like when it is? And I being secretive. Um, then descending a little bit further, the temperament survival games. If you're familiar with Eve DeLunis's work with temperament. Um, project Charlie, yes. Is it possible to give an example of any in the seventh? <laughs> yes, um, that is when, so I, I find that uh, one is it could be just generalized paranoia, that thinking somebody is doing something that they're not actually doing. So they're detecting a pattern which isn't an invisible pattern which is not actually there. So ENFP, for example, or INTP are very good at noticing invisible patterns in the world. Those might be patterns in people's behavior or they might be patterns in the natural scientific world. Um, noticing them live as they happen, as opposed to an eye, which is like stepping back and gathering data and looking for patterns in a sort of like quiet, intuitive space. The any type is, is noticing those and working with them live. And when it's in the seventh position or eighth position, so same with ESFP, ISTP, and so on, they're, they're noticing invisible patterns, but those are incorrect. Like there's not actually a pattern that's happening. So the ISFP is accusing somebody of behaving a certain way and what they're actually not doing that behavior. And in fact, the person may be the, the ISFP or ESTP or whatever is projecting their own behavior onto the other person. Oh, just a quick example. My husband is ISTP mm. and he saw, he saw my receipt I went to a sushi restaurant. So now he thinks that I go to sushi restaurants all the time. So he's always accusing me of doing that like that, right? Yeah. He saw it one time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, and it seems very strange to people with an intuiting preference in particular, because we're like, where are you even coming up with that pattern? Um, and it's very difficult to convince them otherwise. It, it, that's because it's an invisible thing that's out there. 
somewhere. It could also show up as conspiracy theorizing in, in a broad scale, like from watching the news, one example of something, and then there's this whole thing that is generated. Yeah. Um, Ariel, could I offer just an observation there? Yes, please. Some of what we're talking about also sounds like when these functions are not in healthy balance, like higher up in the stack. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, it's the space where the person is the one, one sidedness somewhere has led to a continuous imbalance that ripples through the whole psyche. And, and so the, there's stuff that's coming up, which is really unhelpful and it's coming up repeatedly. Um, and, and that's, it's not as pervasive as a, a temperament survival game, which, which could be going on in a very, very unhealthy way. Uh, but it's something that will come up when the person is under stress. Um, and that's, uh, and, and of course the stress might last for a little while. I've definitely noticed behavior like with this coronavirus stuff. Uh, there was a friend of mine whose ESFP preferences who saw people on Facebook posting pictures of themselves hiking and not as big groups, just like a pair or one person hiking and taking pretty pictures of nature. And, and he really became enraged and was saying like, it's really just horrible that you're posting these pictures of people or yourself enjoying things in nature when others of us, and not meaning himself, by the way, he he's, doesn't have the virus or something, he says, but there are people who are sick and stuck at home. Like, how dare you show pictures of nature? And that was not the usual ESFP response to, you know, that it seemed really took me by surprise. And I thought, you know what, that's, I'm not going to even respond to that. And it has nothing, it wasn't directed at me. Uh, it was directed to somebody else. But I thought, you know what, he's just acting out of a place of stress. And it's like uh, this very judgy kind of, um, you know, I think it was probably FI, but in a really unusual way. And I'm like, I'm just going to let that slide. So some of the best things when the person is there is like the, the opinionated, the functional compensation is just to ignore it, in, at least in my experience, unless it's, it, it gets to be a survival game and then that's different. Yeah. Uh, and then we can go down further, narcissism, borderline personality disorder, uh, and to stuff that is now you suggest that, that's going to a, a therapist. Um, and they get into things like addiction, violence, uh, clinical depression, uh, generalized anxiety, mania, where the person is, is no longer noticing, like they're not even consciously aware that they have a problem, even if, you, even if they're getting feedback uh, that, that from the, both the physical world and, and other people. They're, they're not able to get out of it or notice it. Um, and that's, uh, that can be then scary both for, for them and for, for the people around them. So it's just, you know, the, Jung was a clinician, as a psychiatrist. He was very interested in this whole range of things. And that's why one-sidedness was such a concern. And he would, mostly when we think of type, we're thinking of this middle zone, the sort of the functional compensation is the stuff where we're in the grip. And, and then Yves de Lunas took a little bit deeper and then normally we don't get into the really clinical stuff like narcissism or, or borderline, but, but those, you know, the, those are things that manifest. Those are kinds of one-sidedness. And just, I know because we're short on time, I just want to mention the other two. Uh, the taking the daily pulse is um, that we have attitudes. And I mean that in the general sense, opinions, beliefs, preferences, affiliations, uh, they come in many flavors. They're very specific, usually. You know, are, are you, uh, what is it, labor or Tory or, or something else? Uh, do you prefer chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry ice cream? Um, are you, are you pro-Brexit or against Brexit? Um, and these attitudes are, are culturally specific to even events that are a particular era. And, and they help form or they reflect the ego's brick and mortar. That they're, 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 they serve a purpose. I mean, people have strong attitudes. And in fact, attitudes are quite difficult to shift. Um, and I don't espouse trying to convince somebody. In fact, the research in psychology shows time and again that presenting, quote, facts, data, whatever to people can actually even further anchor them more deeply in their opinion. 
And, and so it reflects one-sidedness. Uh, and, and people often think of these attitudes as being highly reasonable, even though they know that they're on, you know, they like this football team and are very much against this other football team. Uh, and for some people, that, that's very personal. Um, trying to change people's political opinions or, or affiliation is next to impossible. Uh, because it really is a brick and mortar that's there. And how do we know when something has come up, when we've crossed an attitude, because there's a physical or emotional reaction? Um, and the, the other common tell is that we're going to idealize somebody who is like the, our favorite football player or our favorite politician or, or in, is dehumanizing the other group at the same time. And so that's a tell. And, and I don't espouse that we try and change any of those things. I'm really much more, that's why type is great, because type is, is about the, the person in, in a very practical way and not about their specific opinions or something. Um, and that we merely consider this as a barometer, that something comes up that it evokes a strong response, it's an attitude, and this is like, oh, okay, it's like taking our temperature and our temperature is higher at this moment than some other time. And that's simply saying some one-sidedness is going on. Um, and, and I can think back to my college years. And I remember seeing a display that was about like uh, informing people about smart sexual behavior. And I thought the display was really stupid. I mean, the INTJ, I'm seeing something. It just was like a bunch of balloons and, and handing out balloons to people and like they had these very colorful signs. I didn't know about type then, but I just saw it as something that was really stupid and unscientific and whatever. Then there was an interview with the person in the newspaper, uh, the, you know, the college newspaper, the Daily Trojan. And I remember the person saying, oh, balloons attract people's attention and they're very colorful and fun. And we just wanted to make it, you know, this is like sexual health awareness is like something fun. And I thought, oh, this was stupid. Like this is a really serious subject. But in retrospect, I realized this person was probably an ESFP or maybe an ESFJ. And like, yeah, is actually speaking to, to the majority of people, not me. And what they were saying was actually quite sensible that do make it fun and colorful and, and get people's attention and balance out something serious. Uh, but I didn't have that opinion at the time. I had a very snarky opinion uh, that was a typical INTJ, INTP kind of reaction to it. Uh, and now I see it quite differently, but it really took type development for me to shift my attitude that it's okay to present something serious in a fun way. And uh, the last thing was just relating to uh, identifying and clearing baggage, baggage and, and what, what is that baggage um, and we don't have time to go into that, so you can refer to the slide here of what these are. Um, and, and the sort of the, the antidote I see to it is body-mind practices. And uh, I believe that there's a right body-mind practice for every type. Um, Hatha yoga, for example, I feel is really good for SJ types. It's, it's pretty decent for the NP types. So in other words, introverted sensing, extroverted intuiting. Whereas Kundalini yoga is much better suited to the NJSP types. And there are many other activities, um, gardening, running, trail running, uh, rock climbing, uh, swimming, uh, all of these things, um, uh, breath work, whatever it is, that they aren't necessarily extroverted sensing, that they can be very slow. Tai Chi is another example of introverted sensing, extroverted intuiting, calming the monkey mind to very slow, deliberate patient action. So there are many different body-mind practices that help balance and, and sort of deal with the baggage that's here uh, to identify and, and to relax those. And I give some body-mind advice. You'll see that in, and this is from my book, Jung on Yoga, and this is actually from another workshop, but, but just so you know that this is here. Uh, I don't have time to show the human connection video. We'll just have to do that in 2021. But this is a, another, the finally Jung, this is the last meaningful slide, is uh, his shamanic work. And this is, again, body-mind practice dealing with one-sidedness at the archetypal level. 
that we have inherent one-sidedness because we are, mo most people, 99% of people, biologically, physically male or female. Uh, we're all human, but what is the non-human world? Birth and death, uh, the natural versus the artificial, being and nothingness. Uh, the, these are the kinds of things that we could, one-sidedness is not necessarily at the type, just at the type level, it's at the archetypal level. And that is just tremendous, you know, living in advanced, uh, we'll say like, you know, the interconnected global civilization versus tribal jungle civilization. You know, there's all these different uh, dichotomies that are there, which we just live with um, and, and are very much at the archetypal level. And are those even worth pursuing that kind of one-sidedness and trying to balance that out? Or, or is that uh, you know, only for, for some lucky people or occasional person to deal with? Psyche as a whole with many aspects, thus this diamond metaphor again, to go back to that. And um, that, that you know, we can represent type not along a spectrum of say thinking, feeling, but as a matrix or a diamond that there's undifferentiated judgment that we go towards thinking or feeling that we can bring those back again and combine them in a new way to have a transcendent judgment. And Jung said this actually results in a new dominant function, not just renewed, but a new dominant function, that if your dominant function is extroverted feeling, it can actually become extroverted transcendent function or just transcendent function is your new function. And he said that was actually the ideal not to be this one-sided, one of these eight, uh, you know, the types, as he described them, but, but to have the transcendent function as your type. And I want to give thanks to Linda Behrens, John Beebe, Steve Myers, Nicole Gruel, Sam, Sandra Bem, and of course, Jung and the British Type Association. All of you are here because of BAFT. Um, Really, really thankful to, to all of these folks uh, for their various contributions. And um, thank all of you for coming. I know three hours is a long time to give, especially sitting in a chair in front of a computer. I wish all of you the best uh, for good health going forward. I know this is a little bit uh, of a scary time. As an introvert, I find staying at home or being in my garden or something very easy and delightful. But uh, when I drive around, I do suddenly recognize the literally millions of people who, have, uh, who are not working, who are um, a very uncomfortable being home all the time. It's very disruptive. Uh, the extroverts, um, you know, I have a housemate now who's an extrovert and who just drives around in the car for half an hour as a way to stay sane and not just be trapped at home. So that's, uh, I wish really all of you the best with in the coming month, particularly two months, resources. And uh, for all of you, just think about what is your takeaway besides the handouts? What is your personal aha moment for today? Uh, Jane Kesey uh, introduced me to this idea after one hour or three hours. What's our one takeaway? Otherwise, I'm gonna stay on here for another 15 minutes or so, uh, just to answer individual questions from people. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Alan um, and Jerry. Uh, thank you, Leah and Doris um, for your contributions here. Sarah as well, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, for you and Richard both, I wouldn't even be here right now. We wouldn't all be here except for the work of BAPT. Um, Megan, thank you so much uh, for participating. Harumi, arigato gozaimasu. And um, oyasumi nasai, as I know it's a very late in Japan. And um, Ian as well, I know you've probably left now. But uh, David also for your, your questions. And um, anyone else that I may have missed. Nico, thank you. And if, for those of you who are wondering, I am um, working on fleshing this out more and uh, turning this into a book. I don't know when the timeline for it is, but I really feel like 
the neuroscience is one piece to help support type and, and really to, to, to use type in it as a developmental tool is what is going to really carry it through the coming decades. Uh, as people wonder why not use five factor model or disc or whatever it is, more than ever type needs to reinvent itself and go back to its roots at the same time. Boy, NE and SI, reinventing yourself by going back to your roots. That's, um, and, and that's uh, very much, you know, what type needs. Uh, all, all, it's done in every few decades. I remember in the 90s when there was a whole revolution of, of going back to, to the functions, the cognitive processes. And, and then with Linda and, and David Kiersey and temperament before that in the 70s. Um, really, really great stuff. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, my pleasure. Anybody, you can open up your mics now and just ask questions. I'm just here casually. And if you need to go, I very much understand too. Um, and, and thank you, Shelley, for saying that. It really, yes, is about getting re-energized. And I feel like that's a lot of what these, the, the type programming is about, these sessions, is, is to re-energize and re-inspire us um, to keep up the work. Because in, in a different work, uh, on his talks on Kundalini Yoga, Jung described how, how engaging with the archetypes, I don't, I don't remember his language, but he's talking about basically what we're doing here, like self-help kind of activity. Uh, introspection is something that's like wearing a space suit and going into orbit, and we need to come back to Earth. And so we, we get to go into space and see this beautiful Earth, this pearl uh, or gem floating in space, this living gem, and then we return to Earth in our everyday lives. And, and it's really important to get that, 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 that shot again, you know, of, of vitamin C and B12, so to speak. And by the way, I was just reading this morning again that hospitals in New York are finding that large doses of vitamin C really are helping people, uh, particularly not to, to, to slip into the worst part of this virus reaction, that it helps stabilize them in an intermediate, you know, and, and so that's, a, and it's, you know, even though that seems like it's just folk wisdom, the fact that medical doctors and the hospitals now are saying, please, let's use vitamin C. Um, and I imagine zinc is probably also very good for the immune system and is good for that too. So whatever we can do, it's, uh, it's going to be energizing. Dario, can I ask you something? Oh, please. Yes. It's not about this. Did you go to Cal State Fullerton? Um, what's that? Did you go to Cal State Fullerton? As a university? No, no, no. I, no. I, I went to, um, I know of it. Uh, I've... Um, Did you say I, the I, Daily Trojan? Because they're the Daily Titan, I think. The Daily Trojan was it your, your, your university had? Right, right. So the, the Daily Trojan is for University of Southern California. Yeah. Uh, which is near downtown Los Angeles. And it's a private university. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, so it's not part of the Cal State system. And oh, then where I taught um, full time from 1998 to 2012 was at University of California, Los Angeles. Right, with me, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And California has several, like three different tiers of universities and colleges and, um, you know, like a training school. So it's a little bit confusing with all of these options. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Sorry. Welcome. Sorry. This is Harumi. Um, I have a question about the transcendent function. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I've been very. I've tried, I'm trying to be more, well, actually, I found my TE, my A. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this is what you're talking about with transcendent function. Um, when I'm conscious, <laughs> uh, when I see my FE start to work, mm -hmm. I quickly go to my TE. Like, I quickly check what's the goal here. What's, is, mm. that, is that what this is talking about? It protects, my TE protects my FE. Is that what you're talking about here? I, I do believe that the check you're talking about, yes, is, is um, 
is a practical step that you can take to incorporate that function into your life in some way. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately the transcendent function is just asking for each of the, the, the functions, is it integrated in some way, even if it's very small. Um, you know, FE and TE together share this focus on uh, decision-making and organizing in the outer yes. world. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and the challenge with FE is it's going to be very values-driven um, and, and very much accounting for other people's needs uh, and values as, as well as your own. And with TE, uh, you know, and, and I've seen this quite a bit because my mom is an ENFJ and I know a couple other ENFJs. Mm -hmm. and, and it's quite a challenge because when I give TE input, they really, really don't want to hear it. Um, and some of it is, you know, is me looking ahead three steps, not in an intuiting way, but in a like A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads mm -hmm. to D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if you keep on this path pursuing this value, this is the outcome that you're likely going to get. And then here are two other outcomes which are less likely but also possible. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just doing the numbers in my head. And I, yeah. I really feel for, for ENFJ and ESFJ, in fact, all the FJ types, what could help is saying, like, here, here is not just my goal, but here's where I am now, and here where I was yesterday, and if I continue this, I'm going to be in this other place tomorrow, uh, which is fine. And then drawing, like, a little, like, just listing three possible outcomes from what you're doing and assigning a percent chance to each of them and making sure that the bad outcome, like good, bad, and average, that the bad outcome, mm -hmm. you have some mm -hmm. kind of plan B in case mm -hmm. the bad outcome happens. Right. Uh, but yeah. I, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, but my question is, yeah. So I, I, I hear what you're saying about the outcomes. Um, and yeah, I am, I'm not so good with TE coming at me. <laughs> oh yeah i'm more comfortable with me my using my use of te yeah mm -hmm. but uh but I'm, I'm wondering about this transcendent function so what i just talked about where i'm trying to integrate i mean i i, I, I that's what i think i'm doing but you think it's different or you know no, I'm just that, trying to I'm describe not. the the function a little bit more i do believe what you're saying is absolutely an example of of finding a way in your life and that's the transcendent function, is finding a way in your life, even if it's very small, it's just a moment of stepping yep. and asking, yes. what is the impact? Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Yes. Is that, that's what that's talking about, this transcendent function? It, it, it can be in the very small ways, yes. I know I, I've presented it in a way that makes it sometimes sound very big, um, mm -hmm. but the transcendent function can work in very small ways, too. So, yes. Hmm. Yeah. So I have a quick question about that. So if the eight functions exist and like they're mental, does the transcendent function, is it not mental? Like, is it something else? Like, is it spiritual or whatever you want to call it? My, my personal experience and opinion is that we have several other functions. And, and this is what Jung said as well. He said there's this, this group of mental functions, but he said there are these other functions and he included a religious function, uh, transcendent unity function, and so on. Um, I would say that we have an inner healer function, that we have an inner storyteller function, uh, or inner narrative function. I don't just mean narrating like telling ourselves a story. I mean one that allows us to understand and, and create narrative and that creates narrative for us, makes it comprehensible to us. How is it that we can watch a movie and understand it as a story? In the healer, how is it that we're, what, what is this healing process? How is it that we heal? And, and I'm in the psychological level. Uh, that we face particular issues and we go through a process, you know, psychotherapy wouldn't work unless we had a healing function already operating somewhere within us. Uh, sort of like, you know, we have a conscience and we have a conscience function. And, and so that's, um, I would say that the transcendent function is, is something that is, is above the level of, it's sort of like a meta function is above the other functions. And, and is a little bit similar to maybe like the inner healer or the inner storyteller. 
in terms of it being this sort of very broad and abstract, but it's there to help us reconcile and, and it's a growth function. And it's, it's sort of at the center and, and above all of the others. Yeah, that's why I wondered if it was in a different dimension or if that, or like how that works, but I have my own theories about it, but I didn't know like if it existed. Yeah, like so it's not, it's not mental. Right, it's, it's not just, it's primarily psychological. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, there, there's like brain, which is a physical like wetware. And then there's mind, which is information processing and is mental like sorting, categorizing, comparing, uh, daydreaming, all of these things. And then their psyche, which includes the whole system of the person, the unconscious, the environment, everything is, is the domain. And that's why I said at the beginning that the psyche includes like these external products mm. of who we are and, and manifests and involves the environment. Like extroverted feeling, it involves other people a lot of the time. And, and that's part of how the function works. And that's um, more so than probably other functions. Extroverted sensing requires a physical environment to be meaningful. And that's, uh, so I, I do believe that, you know, the psyche and the transcendent function include everything, including society and, and our bodies and the, the social environment, all, physical, all of that. And then from Teresa, we have a question relating to the JP function, uh, which came from, right. So J and P is, is like the, the fourth letter in the code, right, did come from Kath Catherine Isabel Myers. Um, and looking for the idea that people with a strong P preference are more likely to be late and so on. Do you know of any book or paper? Um, openness. You know, that's really interesting. So I would say uh, if you want to search, and this is true for everybody, if you're interested in a particular question, which could be timeliness and lateness or autism or success and satisfaction in marriage or whatever it is, that the Milo database. So I would say um, uh, go to www.capt.org. Then look for the Milo database. It's in one of the drop down menus. And Milo is like the Myers, I don't remember what the rest of Milo stands for, but it's, um, this is for everybody. You can find, um, you can search for uh, papers and books on any topic related to type. You just type in the search bar like autism or uh, openness or something like that and you're going to find um, there, there will be at least one usually and maybe like a dozen or two dozen papers that come up. Um, dual process theory. Okay, interesting. So the Nico here also has a, a lead on this. Oh, thank you. Yes, David, thank you for Mary and Isabel's library online. Mary and Isabel, what's that? Yeah. So it's just uh, the, the, so that must be um, Isabel Myers and um, oh, what is her last name? Mary, uh, I sat in a session with her in the 90s. Why can't I remember her name? She really support Mary McCauley. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. She supported uh, Isabel Myers and a lot of her work. And I was very lucky to hear her personal story of working with Isabel Myers at the, the Phoenix type conference back in what is it? 1997 or 95, something like that. Yeah. Thank you. You will process theory. I don't know what that is. I don't know either. It's something to look up. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of the idea um, that you can that the the people will respond in one of two ways to uh, certain tasks, uh, which is they'll either kind of 
have quite a quick, like snappy process, which is kind of like perception in, in the Myers-Briggs, or they'll have like a much slower reason process, um, which is kind of like judgment in the Myers-Briggs. Um, and there, there's a whole bunch of experiments that people have done where you, they, they've either, either primed someone to, to say, oh, can you think about this slowly before answering? Or they've said, no, no, no don't think about this, like do it quickly. Um, and you get very different answers. Um, they basically ask people trick questions. Um, and then obviously in, in that circumstance, the people who think quickly get it wrong and the people usually, and the people who think slowly kind of tend to get it right. Um, but the really interesting thing about that piece of research in my mind is that um, like the, the Jungian stuff, they find that people have an innate preference. So if you don't tell people how to think up front, then some people will naturally answer quickly and some people will naturally think about it and, and do a more reasoned process. Is this within the Myers-Briggs um, concepts or is it a separate theory? Separate theory, but I think it's the same thing personally. Because I'm interested that you've equated um, P with quick thinking and J with slow thinking because I thought I could see it. I could see it the other way around as well, that P's seek openness and therefore they don't make judgments quickly, whereas J's do. So the way I see it is P is literally like perception, like when you when you physically see something, you know, literally using your sense of sight, then you don't even think about it at all. You come to a judgment about what something looks like, a judgment of sorts, without doing any thinking. It just spontaneously arises in your mind. And that's what I think both the S and N functions are like. Um, whereas the, the, the F, the feeling and the thinking functions are more of a conscious reason thinking process. I don't know whether the Dario's got a comment. I mean, I guess we come from different. Yeah, no, I, I don't know because I, I wouldn't want to, you know, read it and to inform myself. Um, yeah, whenever there's two different theories, you know, probably can be matched in different ways. And I guess what comes to mind is that, you know, when we look at the function level, everybody has at least two functions that they'll be using in, in awareness. And so some of it could be circumstantial, whether it's the dominant or auxiliary, and then which one is perceiving function and which one is judging function. And then J and P is type code relating to which one is the outer world. And then, you know, Isabel Meyer's arguing for the outer world function being the most relevant to a lot of situations, because that's how people, uh, that's what we're going to encounter when we're with other people is sort of the first thing. Uh, and I imagine in a scientific experiment, that oftentimes it will be the outer world reaction that will happen first, unless the person is primed to do differently. Um, you know, I, I usually give like an extroverted thinking response to things unless I'm given permission or asked to, to you know, given the time to use introverted intuiting. And that's just not that they all work always separately, but I'm just thinking like I, I could see how the basic concepts like priming and that we have these different modes and, and certainly in the brain, there is a fast and slow. Uh, there are two different distinct circuits in the brain in terms of when input comes in and does it go to the front of the brain immediately or does it go to the back of the brain first to go through these comparisons with memory and, and with uh, you know, some kind of reasoning with the framework and then move to the front of the brain only after that. Um, and uh, oh, great! Thank you. There's a, another another lead in here for um, a shorter paper: maps of bounded rationality. Great. Well, I'll take one more question, and I think we'll wrap up. Um, and I'll get some breakfast, and then the rest of you, I guess, will get dinner. Dinner, indeed. Yes, or something like that for a few of you in the United States. Yeah. So, Dario, just tagging out that last question, you you had in your book on the neuroscience, you talked about the math problem. So I don't quite agree with Nico. I think some of it is your sort of nurture environment. Um, what is the activity you're doing? How were you taught to do that? Um, you know, cause you, you kind of showed that, you know, you can arrive at the same answer, but you may not arrive there in the same way. And mm. so clearly that's, that's a preference but also maybe a learned, a learned pattern. I, I'm hearing here the opportunity for somebody to do a, uh, what is it, a, a typeface article <laughs> or a, a workshop in the coming year on the topic. No, and I do think it's important because when there are theoretical frameworks out there that are based on experiments 
and, and accepted in academic psychology to connect those with type, um, you know, is building a bridge to that community and um, can sometimes also deepen our understanding of what's going on with type. And that's, uh, you know, e e even if it's, there's no conclusive answer, it really stimulates discussion and gets people to think. Um, especially because, you know, this is a part of the, the JP in, in the type code is something that's contentious. Um, you know, was it necessary? Does it end up confusing people? Uh, in Socionics, the sort of Russian version that, that they took from Jung, they actually, uh, you know, JMP is based on the dominant function, not on the extroverted function. Maybe that was a better approach. Uh, so it is an area of contention and it's something interesting to, to look at. Um, and yeah, sorry, um, I should just say on that, that this uh, mapping only makes sense if you take that approach of it being based on the dominant function rather than the, the extroverted yeah. one, if that makes sense. Sorry. Yes, yes, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. And then that's an example then where, where the type code, even though it was convenient at the time to make an assessment, uh, can end up confusing people. And, and that's why you'll see that even though I refer to the type codes, because we all know them, that really today was all about the, the, the functions. And that's um, not, not that the only temperament is a great tool and in interaction styles as well, but that's, uh, that's that. Well, thank you, uh, all of you for staying the extra few minutes and participating. It was uh, a delight and so good that even in this, this quarantine time that we can be on the other sides of the world and still come together. Um, thank you, Tim Berners-Lee for the World Wide Web <laughs> and uh, all of those who came after. So all of you have a healthy and uh, happy week going forward. And uh, may this be food for thought. And I know some of us now have more free time, so that can also be time for type development too. And that's uh, without making it too much of a job. Um, don't want that either. Absolutely. Thank you again, Nico, David, Teresa. Appreciate your messages here. And Megan, all of you, Jennifer as well. And uh, until we all meet again. Cheers. Thanks, Daria. Thanks, Dave. Okay, and then stop.